few of us were uh, talking and looking over some technical presentations about PCB monitoring. And based on the follow-up, we realized that, um, and this is probably obviously to you all, obvious to you all, but that, that we work on, we being contaminant people who are investigate or manage contaminants in the, in the ecosystem, we work on similar problems across programs. Um, and information exchange is sometimes limited, meaning that, that you know, a, a cool or interesting or applicable study in one area may not make its way across, you know, to, to folks on the other side of the country. Um, and so we decided that, that um, we would try uh, to put together some some um, uh, symposium focusing on information about managing PCBs in the environment, and we do so in a way basically respond to the participants and, and find out what they're interested in. Um, and so we we had uh, one symposium. It was Mario. When was it? It was Jan uh, January last year. So so a year ago ish. Um, kind of giving an overview. Uh, we pulled people and there was there was quite a bit of interest in source tracking. And so we held another source tracking um, symposium that was in June. Um, and again, asked the question, what are you guys interested in? And building materials came up as a, as a topic. And so um, we went away and, and did some thinking about an uh, agenda and, and put the, together the agenda that's, um, I'm really excited about the one that we put together today. So uh, we have four speakers from uh, across the country. Um, and, and broadly speaking, you know, um, uh, the, the first will be sort of the the regulatory environment for for PCBs and building and um, uh, from Miles at Washington State Department of Ecology and then an applied example of how those regulations are working in the San Mateo area, so San Mateo County. Um, we'll do Q and A and then we'll uh, have a little uh, uh, break and then go to a focus on schools. And so that will be the, the late morning or afternoon, depending on where you are. Yeah, and thank you so much for um, for for uh, having me here today. Uh, and it's great to see uh, quite a few folks on the line. Um, uh, again, I'm uh, Miles Perkins. I'm the uh, I'm a toxics reduction unit supervisor at the Washington State Department of Ecology. Um, I've been um, working in the PCB world now for maybe I think two to three years, kind of somewhere in that range, and. I noticed quite a few names on the line there. I see John Wallace's face there. Good to see you, John. Um, so again, I, uh, I'm here to talk a bit about the recent work we've done on how to find and address sources of PCBs and building materials. So um, yeah, we can go to the next slide there. So today um, I'm gonna be giving a kind of a brief um, overview of the issue we were trying to address in our work. Um, what we did to address the issue and talk a bit about that work that we did, which involved um, some early research and um, early focus sheets, some guidance we ended up developing, and then an estimation tool that I'll talk a bit about here in a little bit. The other, um, the other thing I definitely want to spend a little time on is proposed next steps. We created a document as part of this project that talks a bit about what could be done to further the issue, and so I'll talk about that as well. So next slide, please. Um, so yeah, so the issue, as you all know, um, uh, I, I believe on this phone call, um, you know, PCBs were widely used within building materials from about 1950 to 1979. Um, the, uh, the, you know, they were put into a variety of materials, which um, the, our, our guidance actually gets into. Um, it uh, can range all the way from caulking to paint, uh, paints to galspestos uh, uh, wall paneling. Um, you know, it's the, the full gambit of indoor and exterior sort of building materials. Um, Another thing is that, um, you know, Tosca uh, largely regulates the, the building materials um, that um, are currently in use. When it becomes a waste, it does fall to local and state jurisdictions. But while currently in use, Tosca is really the large regulator on this. Um, and, um, you know, one thing uh, that we uh, want to say is that, you know, although Tosca is really on on, on base to, to cover sort of materials management and waste disposal um, on the kind of the front end, which is the source arena we like to be in. Uh, there, uh, there, there's also um, source controls also needed to, in, 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 to prevent and impact water bodies. So, um, so what we mean by that is, you know, um, um, in addition to what Tosca can do, um, you know, NIPTES permits, um, stormwater control, a lot, a lot of stuff that you all um, work with and deal with. Uh, is, is can be another regulatory factor here as well. Um, and then additionally, one thing we did notice is there was a lot of really good in, um, a lot of very good guidance from EPA on, on how to manage materials, what to look for, uh, but they're mostly focused, uh, at least that we, we saw at the time, was mostly focused on indoor air quality and improving indoor air quality. When it came to 
um, stormwater runoff and 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 trying to make sure that that was a primary um, focus. Uh, there, there was not a lot there. And so we wanted to um, try to help fill that gap in the state of Washington. And that's kind of what led to some of the work. So if we keep uh, go to the next slide. So here, here's just a quick image. Um, we talked a bit about materials. You can see they're found in paints, uh, galspestos roofing, um, duct sealants, light ballasts is a big indoor one. You get high concentrations of PCBs in legacy ballasts that are still potentially out there for a lot of facilities. Um, hopefully most of those are getting taken care of, but they, they still exist. Um, additionally, window door caulking can be a high concentration PCB um, uh, um, source uh, for stormwater runoff and then joint materials and sidewalks. And um, one thing to kind of keep keep uh, track of is that, um, uh, you know, these materials, uh, you know, depending on um, when they were made, they can have a wide variety of PCBs concentrations incorporated into them. Um, sometimes contractors, if they were making materials on site for buildings, they had a they had um, a, you know a concentrated source of PCB. They were mixing into the material to you know add flexibility and longevity, and and so it's a wide variety. And and every building, even depending even from brand to brand or product to product, can be widely different. So, um, and here's just a couple of examples of, of what those materials look like. So uh, next slide. And here's also just a bit of like a very high level sort of pathway, you know, um, one thing we were very focused on was the environmental component of this work. Precipitation can lead to stormwater runoff. Um, it'll hit uh, building materials. Um, one thing that we I just want to really want to point out is the construction sites. I know when when these materials are getting or when these buildings are getting demolished and or renovated, uh, disturbed sources of PCBs can lead to high concentration runoff, and that's kind of one of the big things that we're usually that we're worried about in the in the materials. And I'll I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, but but ultimately, uh, it, it tracks from um, stormwater to water bodies, typically impacting sediment um, in those water bodies and accumulating over time, which can impact fish populations, um, and um, um, and can 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 be uh, uh, even a human health risk if if you're if you're in impacted water body areas fishing. Um, for that stuff. So that's the, the main trail that we took. Uh, next slide, please. Just to add a little bit of regulatory context, the um, under TOSCA, there's, um, um, the materials are, are typically managed as bulk product waste if they're under TOSCA and you're, you're dealing with uh, building materials. Um, remediation waste, which is um, waste that can get impacted around buildings um, or can be deemed, um, you know, uh, remediation waste by by facilities uh, is is something that uh, can be handled a little differently. And so, so again, remediation waste is PCB waste due to spills or releases. Um, bulk waste is derived from manufactured products. So if you're removing a panel or you're removing building parts, um, you can fall under TOSCA and you're therefore regulated under 40 CFR 761.62 which is the, the Toxic Substance Control Act. Um, and just to, to keep this in your mind, um, you know, if it's if it's greater than 50 ppm, you must address once characterized. So if you find that on your site, um, you're, you know, you're, you're no longer um, in some ways authorized for use or you need to work with EPA in order to remove that source um, in a timely manner. Um, and so one of the big, just this, this leads into some of the, the issues we've seen at Washington State, in Washington State is that there's no good mechanism requiring owners or to characterize before they abate or renovate building materials. Um, this is one of the, I think the big, uh, the big triggers is, um, yeah, again, if, if you're not, at, if you're not being asked to look for it, um, you, you may just decide to not look for it. And so PCBs kind of falls in that, that weird realm at the moment. Um, but on the other side, if you are looking for it, if you characterize it and find it, um, it could trigger further investigation and action if you find it above 50 ppm. So that decision point of when to when to look for it can be a big one to to a business, an individual business, or, or anything like that. So that to me is is kind of one of the big um, the big hurdles to this work sometimes. And I'll talk a little more about that here in a second. So uh, next slide. So just a little more context, you know, I mentioned up front that uh, EPA and TOSCA really largely regulates this world, but um, under under our water quality, quality regulations in the state of Washington, it's unlawful to discharge to pol uh, polluted state waters. Um, so, you know, surface waters must be protected for their designated use, meaning that um, uh, local jurisdictions or even the state of, uh, state of Washington, at least in Washington state, are required to 
um, be protective. And so if they do find PCBs um, under like a NIPBES permits or uh, municipal stormwater permits, um, those discharges may not be allowed and it can cause a violation. So there is kind of another angle to potentially get to the issue of PCBs if you find it in your runoff. Although um, I, I do think outside of a few municipalities who have done this really well, uh, it, it is it can be a struggle and those municipalities are not always looking for for PCBs and the concentrations that are required or that may be at, at, at those business or facilities. So but I just wanted to make sure to point that out is that water quality does have an angle there as well. Um, and uh, yeah, next slide, please. So with, with that context, um, this project got kicked off a couple years ago. Um, a piece, uh, you know, part of what we uh, really, really found out was that PCBs were being released to the environment via external building materials. Um, you know, they're expe uh, we expected uh, they'd be released in higher quantities, you know, during unmitigated demolition or renovation. Um, so that was something we wanted to try to develop guidance around is when they're getting demolished or when they're getting renovated, uh, how can we be most protective of the environment at that time? Um, additionally, um, you know, uh, uh, these materials must be managed before they're disturbed um, or added to, to landfills. So, you know, one of the things is we want to reduce leaching. Uh, we also want to reduce the impact on human health from, from fishing. So, so that's one of those things is we, we thought that making sure these end up in the right place, uh, wherever that, that is, um, uh, that they're going to be protective of the environment and managed appropriately. So those are those were kind of our, our lofty goals up front. Um, if you go to the, the next page, um, we were awarded back in 2020 uh, about uh, $370,000 by the Puget Sound Partnership to develop a, uh, to act on the uh, PCB chemical action plan, which had been developed many years before. Um, ideally, this would be developing a PCB task force that would go through and develop this guidance. And uh, we would also work with EPA to prom promote awareness on this issue. Um, and so uh, I'll talk a bit about that work now and get into kind of some of the work products we de developed as part of the, the project. So next slide. So the, the goals of this project was to develop guidance for businesses um, and consultants to identify, characterize, and abate during demolition or renovation. Uh, we also uh, wanted to make sure that if, if they were going to go through these steps, we wanted to make sure businesses understood the costs associated with that um, with regards to sampling and also abating. Um, we also wanted to, at the very end of this project, design and propose a PCBs in building materials abatement program, which um, we can talk about here in a second, but it, it resulted in a proposal that includes recommended further actions. And I can get into some of those at the very end. Um, so I'll continue to kind of blaze through some of these early slides so we can get to that good stuff. Um, so next um, next slide, please. Early on, um, the first about the first year of the work, we did a kind of compiled a lot of information and developed a narrative review um, that uh, goes through and actually um, tries to tries to understand the, the issue better. Um, we have that internal paper, and I'm, I'm happy to share it with others if they're they're interested. But it really served as the basis for the guidance document we developed. Um, we also did an early focus sheet that just indicated ecologies working on this issue. We're planning to actually um, send out um, uh, guidance, or we're actually planning to send out guidance in 2022, which was our, our initial goal. And um, and then we developed a website to kind of address the issue. So uh, next slide. We, we developed um, guidance. And so the um, we spent about a year and a half um, looking closely at this document. I'm working with local local um, partners, um, look, working with EPA, just to make sure that we were on the right track towards towards filling some of the, the gaps in um, protecting stormwater. And so um, we just went through background and regulations. So I'm gonna briefly touch on um, the three main sections of this guidance document we developed. Um, the first one was steps to identify and characterize. And we focus on screening and in, uh, inventorying your suspect materials. We also talk a bit about the sampling and characterization process and um, how to plan and execute demolition and renovation. Um, and then the, th the, the third thing is the actual abatement and waste management process. So um, that's that's a, a big chunk of this. And then our, our fourth section is stormwater BMPs while awaiting removal. And this is um, just an acknowledgement. Right now, there's not a, um, you know, right. we talked a bit about the regulatory um, 
uh, triggers in looking and, and finding PCBs and having to deal with it. Um, we think there's a lot of potential sites out there that have PCB issues that we don't necessarily know. And we would really appreciate and, and want businesses to be as protective as possible. And so part of what we have in this is, is stormwater BMPs to make sure you're implementing while you're either um, awaiting demolition, especially if you have suspect materials or, or, or renovation. So uh, next slide. Uh, the, the whole first section is really geared towards um, in trying to empower businesses, consultants, and contractors with just some basic skills, uh, skill sets and tools that allows um, them to say, okay, our building potentially has PCBs in it. So uh, the screening tools look at building age. Again, I mentioned 1950, 1979. If it was built in that range, there's the potential it has PCBs in it. Um, building structure and use, there's a lot of guidance in there about what building types typically had um, materials and had, or sorry, had uh, PCBs in their materials. There's a lot of concrete slab construction um, out there in the world built in this time frame that have PCBs in their joints. So we, we talk a bit about specifics there and what to look for. Um, and then we also try to provide other details such as um, um, a, uh, a table that actually helps you try to inventory and quantify what you may have. If you've ever done or ever had an asbestos um, a HERA survey done to look for materials, it, it looks very similar to that. And it's just to try to get you to quantify and look at what you might have on site before going through with sample. So uh, next next slide, please. We, we actually included some um, um, example um, uh, some example materials. And, uh, you know, I think we're actually going to be hearing from, from folks from California today, but we, uh, the Bay Area Stormwater Management Agency had some really good guidance on um, like sampling um, um, frequency, um, you know, and how to best conduct a, a representative testing program. So we included information there and recommendations on what you could do to just get good coverage. Um, additionally, you know, we, um, we also, uh, um, looked at uh, a greater than 50 ppm um, for Tosca, you know, less than 50 ppm for other other federal state requirements. And so trying to understand that sort of, um, I guess, handoff between between whether you're going to need to act on one of those samples is important. But we did want to um, give folks an idea. These are not EPA federal requirements when it comes to frequency, um, but they're really good guidelines. And when you work with EPA um, directly on a site, uh, they'll likely work with you on representative sampling that that might fit this model. So, um, but uh, but it just, we just wanted to give good examples for people reading the guidance. Um, next next slide, please. Um, so I talked about um, a bit about the abatement and waste. This is that third section. You know, we 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 um, we get into the specifics on how to prepare a work plan. We talk about waste handling, storage, and disposal under Tosca. We also get into uh, what the abatement looks like, so how to best prepare and and uh, for, for stormwater BMPs and being protective while actually operating a construction site. Uh, we also talk a bit about addressing exterior building materials. The um, we we don't get into every material um, um, imaginable um, in the guidance, but we focus on the four uh, well three big ones plus a miscellaneous section that kind of tries to get broadly at a lot of different types of materials. Uh, so we cover caulking and expansion joints, best practices around that. Same thing with paints and coatings and asbestos panels. And then we get into miscellaneous materials where we cover things like ductwork and other stuff. So, uh, but those are, this is kind of the, um, the where we went, I guess, when it came to abatement and waste management. Um, next slide. And then I will not go into every detail here because I want to make sure I spend some time getting to the recommendations, but um, we also developed, again, a whole section on stormwater BMPs while awaiting removal. Uh, we, we tried to cover the full gambit. A lot of these are recognizable from other types of stormwater management. So it's, it's nothing extraordinary, but um, we do try to um, cover like making sure not to power wash or pressure wash areas that are suspect to be containing PCBs. But just best practices that would limit the um, stormwater um, you know, contamination that, that could happen if your site has PCBs on it. So, um, so again, a lot of more details in the guidance on these materials. Um, next slide, please. So uh, to, to kind of, um, as a companion to the guidance, we also wanted to just be realistic. If we were gonna be asking and um, providing materials for people to carry forward some of this work, we really wanted to do our best 
to help businesses understand the scale and cost something like this this would this would be um, and so we developed a estimation tool um, we uh, tried to factor in a lot of things to this estimation tool and we worked closely with a contractor uh, that helped us develop the tool it was uh, looking specifically at incorporating potential plans and reports uh, it incorporates best management practices, um, sampling and analysis, covers demolition and renovation, and then transportation. So every element of the guidance is included on here. You can find, um, I'll make sure to share uh, the slides with, with the link so you can actually go check this, this table out and play around with it. It has, a com it has a companion limitations document that just talks about what we considered and what we assumed as part of these costings. We don't anticipate you to get a very accurate estimate, but we hope you get a ballpark estimate to understand the scale of your project. Is it going to cost $10,000? Is it going to cost $100,000? Uh, we'd love to make sure that you know, you're know you understanding the ballpark of your decision when it comes to looking for and trying to sample and, and deal with your PCBs. Um, uh, next slide, um, I talk a little bit more about some of our assumptions. We had labor assumptions for the year 2022. We uh, talked a bit about costing for materials, disposal, contractor march up markups. Um, we did not consider special buildings, um, different heights of buildings. If you're only if you're only renovating like the top floor of a five story building, you're going to have more costs associated with that. Um, we also didn't uh, consider permits, which can vary between um, which can vary between different uh, jurisdictions and then uh, noise restrictions. We didn't also talk about that either. So, um, so yeah, so uh, lots there. Um, the, the other, uh, so, so yeah, if you have, if anyone, if anyone's interested or has questions on this, uh, please let me know. I'm happy to talk to them about our tool and what we, what we considered as part of that. So uh, next slide. So, um, so yeah, uh, um, we, uh, as part of the deliverable for our NEP funding, we actually um, kind of kind of put forth a document that talked a bit about like recommended next steps and how we could see to bridge the gap between, um, you know, um, the uh, the issue of, of 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 businesses, you know, not looking for PCBs necessarily as part of their demo project. And what could be done to try to further that issue? And so we kind of. We kind of uh, um, included um, four main areas. Um, the first two, we, we talk a bit about education and outreach. Um, you know, there, uh, as part of that education and outreach, we um, really want to work with, um, really want to work with uh, businesses. I'm so sorry, I'm getting all these messages. I need to turn off my teams. <laughs> so sorry, they keep popping up. Um, so uh, yeah, so, so with education and outreach, we ended up um, um, uh, recommending that as part of this, um, you know, there's buildings throughout the whole state and they do impact areas that have a lot more commercial buildings than others. And so part of the outreach um, that we initially proposed is, well, we need to talk to the communities that that could be impacted by PCBs in their areas. Um, and uh, we one of the first steps we recommend is trying to make sure that um, we're, we're talking to those communities, like, is this even a priority for them? Um, what are they concerned about? Um, do they understand the issue? And can we, can we help uh, understand that issue? There's a lot to, a lot to say there. So, but um, um, ideally, uh, ideally that outreach is, would be a first step as part of this to understand what the community looks like. The next step would be to do research and data collection. So um, one thing is, you know, um, we would want to uh, do a couple of a couple of recommendations. One of them was to evaluate other building material management programs. So I know lead and asbestos have very kind of solidified programs that are are, are part of um, ASTM methods, and um, you know, there's training for those programs. PCBs doesn't have that, so maybe there's ways and elements of that work that can be pulled into the PCB world. Um, those are things to look at. Uh, mapping and better identifying high priority er priority areas is important. Uh, tax assessor data shows age of buildings, and you can pretty quickly build a GIS map that shows buildings that could be suspect to contain materials. Um, we think that mapping and understanding areas that have high concentrations of older buildings could be really important uh, for the work moving forward. Um, we think source tracing programs in stormwater could be super helpful. I know there's quite a few programs already out there, at least on the west side that I know of. Those can be important. Um, one of the one of the other big ideas we have for research is a PCB abatement pilot study. Um, so um, you know, probably uh, testing whether our uh, our estimation tool actually works. So going out maybe uh, funding um, one to two to three um, PCB projects and documenting what it took 
uh, challenges for the project, things like that, um, and supporting um, businesses to, to do this work. And then again, measuring the impact in stormwater runoff prior to and during abatement activities. Can we can we actually like th there's no uh, you know we know materials get disturbed and PCBs potentially have a higher runoff, but measuring that impact and publishing on it could be um, a driver and getting action to, to to get started on that. So uh, next slide. Um, additionally, as next steps, we we've also proposed a slew of um, maybe incentives and funding. So can we um, leverage existing funding sources such as NEP or the water quality combined funding to conduct more stormwater best management uh, practice effectiveness studies for, for different materials that we have on site? Um, additionally, could there be an established program to actually incentivize and partially fund programs that could deal with buildings in vulnerable areas. Um, and uh, that could be um, a really important factor. What's tough is that each project, depending on the size, costs a wide variety of different dollars and monies. So it would need to be a lot, probably a large funding source. Uh, but it's a, it's a good idea if we really want to make headway in a proactive um, assistance capacity. Um, where we could see also big change is on the policy end, which we um, acknowledge can be a, a difficult thing to pursue. But um, under policy, you know, we want to continue to work with EPA and find ways to reduce the burden um, going through the uh, work plan process and trying to ensure um, small businesses can actually pay to do some of this work is, is tricky. And if we can help reduce the regulatory burden of some of that work, I think that could be a very positive step. Additionally, uh, require investigation of potential PCB contaminated materials as part of building permits um, associated with redevelopment. So catching um, stuff that is shared within, um, or sorry, catching, um, catching projects as they're either getting demolished or getting renovated or changed or changing hands, that could be a potential next step to really drive the requirement to sample PCBs. Uh, additionally, requiring businesses to investigate PCBs as part of e ESAs associated with property title transfers. That's another angle that um, could, could be pursued to see if PCBs can start coming into that world. And then additionally, add requirements to um, identify and manage PCBs in building materials in the next um, Washington State Construction st uh, Stormwater General Permit. So really, really solidifying. There actually are a couple PCB um, um, best manager practices that got added recently, which is exciting, but um, we see there's still room for, for more there. So, um, so yeah, so uh, next slide. Um, th that's a very broad summary and I'm happy to share that document with this group, um, but those are some of the next steps we see in trying to address this issue. And again, I just want to thank um, uh, quite a few folks that helped create this document. Uh, EPA was heavily involved in supporting the work and we wanted to make sure we didn't overlap any of their guidance because they also have really good guidance our stuff, again, is, is really focused on exterior building materials. Um, but I also want to say thanks to University of Washington, Seattle Public Utilities, um, and uh, of course, Puget Sound um, NEP program for funding the work. It was, uh, uh, yeah, it was, it, was a, it was a real good project. And I'm, yeah, I'm really excited to see if there's any questions or any follow up. So thank you so much for the time. Great. Thank you so much, Miles. Really appreciate that context and those reflections. Um, we are going to turn things over to Reed to tell us a little bit more about things down in the Bay Area, and then we'll do questions after that, just so that folks can kind of be thinking about what are some of the similarities and differences in how regional programs are, are tackling this challenge. Hey, and it's great to see a big number of people in the audience and uh, the significant interest in PCBs. This is probably the, the most um, people I've ever had in one space. Uh, with this in common interest. So great to great to see um, and nice presentation, Miles. I, I think a lot of what's in my presentation has some uh, uh, carryover or redundancy with uh, Miles in terms of the regulatory context and you know the concern around PCBs and building materials. So um, I'll probably skip through a couple slides on on some of the context and background, but there are some other things that are, uh, nuances and also um, kind of direct application of a PCBs and building demolition program associated with a municipal stormwater permit in uh, <clears throat> in the San Mateo and, and broader actually San Francisco Bay Area region. Um, so I'll just provide a little bit of uh, background in terms of our organization and um, the development of our program, uh, just on this intro slide, and then kind of get into the details of what we did and what we continue to do under the stormwater permit. 
Um, so I, I uh, oversee a countywide stormwater program in San Mateo County on behalf of 21 municipalities. And uh, basically our program, uh, San Mateo Countywide Water Pollution Prevention Program, supports compliance with the municipal regional stormwater permit. So it is a regional permit, it applies to uh, five different counties in the Bay Area. And this is just one portion of compliance under that permit. And uh, some of the documents that I'll share and resources were developed by uh, the region uh, collectively among the Bay Area Stormwater Management Agencies, as, as Miles mentioned. Um, and we have a new collective that's uh, less formal with the same players um, continuing to implement this program. So, uh, so that's just a little bit of background in uh, sort of who we are and, and uh, who did this work. <clears throat> um, so here's an overview of presentation. Uh, there are a couple of acronyms that may be um, somewhat new, uh, including in this, this slide here. MRP just refers to the municipal regional permit. And so uh, that's probably the, the big one. And we have, uh, we go by versions uh, of the permit. We're now in our third cycle of this uh, municipal stormwater permit. So that's where you see MRP 2.0 was the second um, iteration of the permit. And that was where the PCB's building demolition program was first uh, implemented. And then we have a new permit that just went into effect in 2022, and that's MRP 3.0. And the, the requirements continue. So that's kind of <clears throat> the reference there. So I'll talk about both and kind of how they developed and are evolving. And then uh, discussion of the, um, so the review process for projects going through the program um, and what the uh, project applicants need to do versus what the municipal permittees under the stormwater permit need to do. And so that'll give you a sense of kind of how the program operates. Um, and then can have some questions afterwards with Miles. So uh, background, uh, new, new pictures, perhaps a uh, new way of talking about what Miles and probably this group has discussed many times, so I won't go into detail here, but these are some of the things that we <clears throat> have thought about regarding PCBs um, and the leg legacy uses and kind of where uh, the connection is with building materials in particular with the, the paints and caulks and other uh, materials that end up in buildings or have been uh, used in buildings. In the Bay Area, we do have a PCBs uh, TMDL, total maximum daily load um, <clears throat> requirement. And so there are waste load allocations associated with that. Um, the linkage uh, is regarding impairments to uh, wildlife and uh, 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 fishable waters is the, the main impairment. So uh, due to concentrations in sport fish, uh, and the potential for subsistence uh, fishing uh, populations to consume these fish. That's where the, uh, the main linkage is for the water quality requirements and the resulting um, uh, TMDL. And so that, you know, there, there's a risk of cancer associated with PCBs uh, consuming fish that have the bioaccumulating effect of this contaminant. Um, and so that occurred, actually started, I think, back in 1994. There was a fish uh, fishing advisory for certain sport fish in the Bay Area and uh, resulted in the TMDL that is now a regulation uh, within the stormwater permit. And there are many potential sources of PCBs in the Bay Area. And so this uh, graphic kind of shows where uh, potential uh, for source uh, source issues of PCBs can occur. And, uh, you know, so we have dredging, uh, runoff and um, uh, uh, drainage impacts from the Central Valley, wastewater impacts, uh, hot spots from industrial and uh, uh, old uh, military um, uh, facilities, uh, and then run runoff is, is a big one. And um, this actually was runoff was identified as the the largest potential source uh, remaining source in the watersheds of the Bay Area, and so the TMDL specifies a ninety percent reduction in stormwater sources, which is you know fairly significant. Um, and within that category, uh, building demolition was identified as a major source to urban stormwater runoff, and uh, so some of the 
science that kind of um, initiated the, the requirements or formed the basis for the building demolition program uh, requirements go back to a study that was done in the Bay Area uh, that found, you know, looked at uh, the building stock, uh, again, within that time frame of 1950 to 1980 or so, um, and identified <clears throat> through monitoring and sampling uh, the potential concentrations of PCBs in building materials of that, uh, of that date and time period. And uh, there were, you know, 40% of the samples taken from the relevant buildings uh, were showing PCBs of 50 parts per million, and 20% of the sampled buildings were uh, much greater, showing uh, you know 10,000 or uh, 10,000 or greater ppm. And so this was identified as a major issue uh, for us, and that the building stock itself at that time it was uh, uh, probably a decade or so uh, ago when the study was done. Um, showing that uh, there were you know, about 10,000 non-residential buildings for which this could be uh, a problem. So that was sort of the initial basis of the, the program and uh, the impetus for developing the regulations. Uh, but beyond the building demolition program in the Bay Area, there are other uh, activities underway to improve water quality regarding PCBs. And so dealing with those industrial and military hotspots uh, dealing with dredging uh, and contaminated sed sediments when they are um, pulled out of out of the bay and the uh, uh, the drainages to the bay tributaries and uh, uh, channels and whatnot. Um, the municipal wastewater treatment plant operators are uh, cleaning out PCBs uh, as the water as the wastewater is treated, and municipalities are doing other things too, um, working on identifying source properties, these leg legacy properties. Um, supporting abatement in cooperation with the Regional Water Board and the EPA and, and uh, DTSC. Um, developing green infrastructure is another strategy to deal with PCBs and doing things like green streets and uh, uh, other uh, parcel-based projects. And uh, the PCBs and demolition program is another big one. There are some other ones too where we're dealing with uh, PCBs and uh, bridge uh, uh, sealants uh, when bridges are retrofitted or replaced. Um, and also dealing with PCBs in electric utilities is another program. Here's the, the focus for today and for the requirements. So the uh, program started with the prior um, MRP municipal regional permit. And uh, this is sort of the, the basic overview of what that looked like. And so we needed to start out by developing a protocol to manage PCBs in building materials during demolition and doing some of the things that Miles mentioned, ensuring PCBs are not discharged to storm drains when applicable buildings are demolished, um, including a method for identifying applicable, applicable buildings and screening them through the, the program. And uh, having the authority to do this was part of the, uh, the need for municipalities to get the, the programs up and running. And, uh, and another big piece is not listed here is, is actually developing the protocol for <laughs> evaluating PCBs in these select building materials. So we actually had to kind of start from scratch on what, is, what are the methods for sampling um, that would provide uh, consistency and uh, support documentation of what's being found in, in the monitoring. Uh, and so these are the details of what's considered an applicable building. And uh, notably, the requirements do not apply to wood frame buildings or single family residences. And this all started in July of 2019. So the programs got up and running at that time. And every municipality has a program like this in the Bay Area. So it's, it's widespread. Uh, so here's kind of the issue uh, Miles uh, dis uh, discussed in his presentation. Um, and so you can imagine when a, a building comes down, plenty of dust and debris and potential for stormwater runoff impacts. Uh, so uh, the prior collective of municipal stormwater management agencies uh, developed the, the path for this regulation um, and had uh, you know, some coordination and input from the regional board and the EPA in, in this process. Uh, but these are the things that we needed to do. So establishing municipal authority to, to do this via ordinances, uh, resolution or policy, a CEQA notice of exemption to implement the programs, 
uh, developing the application package for demolition permit applicants. So that's actually a tie-in to what Miles mentioned. This whole program operates through municipal demolition permit processes for new and redevelopment uh, or for uh, redevelopment projects where you have these, um, these projects that are from that, uh, from that time period being redeveloped. Um, and then we have some nice instructions and uh, flow charts and whatnot to help support the process. Uh, the protocol, as I mentioned, for evaluating PCBs in sampling uh, and having potentially a cost recovery mechanism to comply with the, uh, the provision of the permit, uh, staff training, and uh, a way to collect the data and report annually for the, the NPDES permit. Uh, so uh, this is uh, what was set out to do, and we uh, developed a uh, a list uh, process of, of the what was eventually five um, select building material types containing the uh, PCBs and the highest likelihood of uh, causing problems during demolition, uh, the highest concentration materials, uh, highest likelihood of uh, you know, crumbling or uh, you know, uh, flaking and so on, which could be an issue during demolition, um, the protocol, and then the regulatory procedures. And so the uh, definitions are actually pretty important going through the development of this program. We got input from the industry, our municipalities, the regulators, and we landed on a, a definition of what demolition means, uh, specifically wrecking, raising, or tearing down of any structure and is intended to be consistent with the demolition activities for uh, contractors in the industry. So the C21 building moving demolition contractors license. Uh, and then the priority building materials that were identified um, are caulk, thermal or fiberglass insulation, adhesive mastics, and rubber window gaskets. And so it's you know important to recognize that that does that's not uh, uh, the comprehensive list of building materials from this age that could or likely do contain PCBs, but these are the ones that were identified as the, the most problematic and uh, the ones that would be least likely addressed through other programs like the universal waste uh, program managed by other uh, regulations. That's kind of where we landed. And I've already mentioned the applicable structures. So here are a couple images of uh, what we identified uh, for the, the five select building materials um, and, and then some uh, sort of the breakdown of caulk and sealants and adhesives versus insulation. So that's kind of a quick way to, to think about it. And then um, some of the other potential sources and building materials, uh, fluorescent light ballast, uh, polyurethane foam furniture, aspiral fluid and transformers, um, which could contain PCBs are managed through separate programs. So that's those, uh, those uh, materials were not included in this program. And so here's the uh, flow chart that kind of shows how all of this um, was intended to work and has been working to date. So uh, the municipalities establish their programs. They have a, a legal mechanism to do this. They notified the applicants uh, through outreach and, and uh, uh, some fact sheets on websites and so on to say, hey, you know, you're know, you going to have to go through this process regardless of, of your program, when you're pulling uh, a demolition permit, you're going to need to certify whether or not um, you have PCBs in your buildings through, uh, through this process. And you can screen in or you can screen out. Uh, if you uh, do not have an applicable structure or you show that PCBs are less than 50 parts per million and you screen out, you still have to certify that you went through that process, but you're no longer uh, engaged in the program. And then if you have PCBs that are greater than 50 ppm, uh, then you need to uh, report the concentrations and estimates of the volume of PCBs containing priority building materials uh, and submit a, a self-certified form to the municipality. So that's kind of the structure. And then the core underlying, underlying theme of all this is that um, this program is intended to deal with uh, PCBs prior, really identifying PCBs prior to demolition, and then understanding that if you find them in your select building materials, you will follow all applicable federal and state laws. And so that, you know, the property uh, owner, the, the project sponsor signs off on that certification. 
So the, the applicant needs to do these things. They need to screen in or out of the program and, and uh, certify that uh, and uh, follow all applicable um, rules and regulations, uh, including things that fall outside the PCB's demolition program for the stormwater permit. And then, uh, and then follow the, the uh, process accordingly if they are screened in. There's another uh, flow chart, just kind of shows you how we providing resources to the municipalities to, to set all this up, but it basically repeats what I just stated in prior slides. Uh, and then we do have a couple of nice documents if you're interested in getting into the details of the, uh, the application um, assessment package. Uh, so the screening package for uh, for project sponsors, and then also the protocol for evaluating PCBs in these select building materials, and that has a ton of details uh, about the the sampling protocols that are uh, required to comply with the permit. And uh, so this is kind of the the information that's in the applicant package, background, instructions, process flow chart, assessment form, and some supporting documentation. And the protocol uh, has all of this in it. Uh, so it talks about what the priority building materials are, um, the sampling procedures down to the equipment, frequency analysis and preservation, everything um, that is necessary to do this, right? Uh, and that was actually a lot of work and we got a lot of great feedback from, from the industry uh, and other uh, others that have done this work um, and actually borrowing from um, protocols for uh, things like the lead and asbestos programs. Uh, so that was really helpful to get this started. Notice to the applicants that you must do all of this stuff. You must, you know, agree that you will follow all the state and federal regulations. Um, and uh, to Miles's point that some uh, requirements may get triggered under lower PPMs than 50 uh, PPM or, or above uh, the 50 PPM. And there might be other things that an, an applicant would need to do accordingly. Uh, EPA has some great resources. So we've pr provided information on uh, where to go. And then during the new permit, uh, again, which just kicked in in May, uh, it was actually effective July 1st of 2022. Uh, made a couple of revisions to the program. It's more or less the same thing, and I'll kind of walk through uh, what this looks like, but there are a, a few things that are new regarding reporting uh, for the uh, the applicants, the project applicants, as well as the municipalities as permittees under the, the stormwater permit. Um, and a few things regarding uh, you know what to do and how to manage PCBs during demolition. So not just you know prior to uh, identifying the issue before it's a problem, but also kind of enhanced construction programs and inspection programs to to manage things a little bit more carefully. And so uh, here's the same flowchart with a few updates in reddish orange. Uh, so the municipalities needed to update the application package that I kind of walked through uh, to, to make changes there. And then the municipalities also need to do these things um, for, for applicable structures that have PCBs over 50 parts per million. They need to uh, receive the hazardous waste manifest um, where it's not uh, required by the, the EPA for prior approval, so that there needs to be some follow-up to the municipality now that needs to be documented. Um, they need to be uh, notified of the start of demolition, which was not a prior requirement. Um, they need to actually inspect the demolition sites, uh, which was also not previously required, and then enhance their construction site control programs. And then the applicant needs to follow through with some of that, uh, that follow-up and um, documentation of what actually happens to uh, the waste as it's, um, as it's managed according to the regulations and providing that documentation to the uh, municipality. They need to also be in the loop on inspections and so on. Uh, and so that's some of the, the new work for the applicants. And uh, so this is kind of uh, all of that in a few bullet points. I won't go through this uh, in too much detail, um, but basically, you know, they need to kind of get up to speed with what's now required in the, the new municipal stormwater permit. And so that went through that outreach process, updating the, um, the building demolition 
permit packages accordingly uh, and just getting the, the industry kind of uh, up to speed on this. And so, uh, so they need to, again, certify, uh, go through that self-certification process that they've uh, uh, analyzed or, or uh, screened their project in or out, and then done the analysis work demonstrating uh, above or below 50 parts per million on any select materials. And then uh, the, the consequences <laughs> for non-compliance are now uh, in greater detail. So that was kind of a, you know, additional information in the applicant package. And they need to determine for themselves, applicants, whether they need uh, prior approval from e US EPA. And uh, that has to do with the, the follow up on a waste manifest requirement as well. Um, and the inspection requirements, as I mentioned. And so here, here's a lot of detail um, as far as what this notification looks like exactly. So, uh, you know, we have five working days in advance of the start of demolition. The applicant needs to notify the municipality, the regional board, and the US EPA. Uh, so everyone knows that this project is happening. And it's, a, it's an applicable structure and it has significant PCBs in these materials. Everyone's uh, now knowledgeable about that. Uh, and they also need to notify um, the agencies after demolition is complete. And then uh, if they, uh, so within five working days of being it determined, notifying the municipality whether advance approval from the US EPA is required for the site. And again, that relates to submitting the hazardous waste manifest uh, for disposal if advance approval is, is not required. So if it's not required, then the applicant has to come back to the municipality and, and uh, present that. If it is required to contact EPA for uh, approval, then it's managed by EPA and it's not an issue for the municipality. Uh, so here's the, the flow chart that's been updated. It's basically the same, uh, same flow chart with the new notification uh, and reporting requirements documented. So that's all included in the, um, the revised uh, pack applicant package and uh, is available um, for municipalities and, and our uh, project sponsors. And so the uh, requirements for permittees are actually somewhat um, you know, fairly progressive and advanced compared to what was required previously. Um, but the big stuff is, you know, they have to now inspect apl applicable structures. Uh, so these demolition sites um, during the rainy season. So that's a new requirement that didn't previously have to do that. Uh, and then they have to show some level of enhanced construction site control programs. And basically what we did here was provided uh, a list of potential improvements or enhancements to existing programs. And then the municipalities can select kind of what they want to do. Um, and so there's some guidance uh, about this. There's a, a memo out to the municipalities on how to implement enhanced programs. So we have the, the baseline program is doing inspections once during the wet season during demolition. And then if the site falls under the uh, construction site inspection program for large uh, properties, one acre or greater hillside sites or a priority site, then they have to do monthly inspections as well. And then the enhancement options for uh, construction programs would be additional inspections um, and then doing uh, new BMPs or modified BMPs during demolition. And so that could be uh, things like street sweeping during demolition, uh, daily uh, for all phases of construction, covering debris with impermeable liners and, and so on. So kind of a big list of different things that the uh, the applicants could uh, could be accountable for here, and the municipals municipalities would require. Uh, so it's up sort of up to the municipalities to determine what they want to do for enhancements. Uh, so here are some other things uh, probably look pretty familiar: enhanced erosion control, run on and run off control, sediment control, uh, site management for dust, waste, materials management, and then non stormwater uh, management as well. I won't go into all the details here because there's kind of a lot, but um, just to note that this is pretty well documented as far as what exactly that looks like for, for all those uh, new BMP requirements. Uh, so, you know, again, number of things under erosion control. Uh, and some of this is borrowed from, uh, from some of the other um, 
toxic materials, um, uh, BMP requirements, you know, so for things like uh, asbestos management, for instance. Uh, so again, borrowing from other programs that are more, you know, well established. Uh, so just kind of running through the list here, sediment controls, um, you know, managing for uh, increased potential for runoff associated with sediment. Site management, these things are pretty familiar for municipal stormwater programs, but um, maybe somewhat different. You know, dust control is not necessarily something that's uh, managed for in traditional stormwater uh, construction programs. Site management, again, um, things may be somewhat familiar, but also different, uh, especially dealing with disposal of waste where you have potential for high PCBs. And this is uh, potentially new work for everyone in terms of what that what those requirements can look like and what the reporting is. Uh, and then non-stormwater management containing decontamination water in, in leak tight uh, containers or, or secondary containment. So again, that would be something that's potentially new to the construction programs. And uh, ramping up, all this needed to start July 1st of 2023. So these programs are now um, being implemented with enhancements. Uh, this is kind of what the municipalities needed to do in terms of getting their inspectors up to speed, uh, maybe changing uh, or in, uh, supporting the uh, PCBs program coordinator uh, and working with EPA on coordination of reporting, uh, and looping in the chief building officials, legal counsel, so everyone is, is in the know about what the requirements are. Uh, and uh, modifying inspection programs and, and trainings and so on. Uh, and then getting, you know, uh, city uh, municipal staff leadership uh, informed as well as part of this, because this is an evolving program. Uh, so this is kind of what that looked like. And then there are reporting requirements, as I mentioned, with the stormwater permit. And so uh, the underlying things are the things that the cities have to report on, the number of applicable structures that applied for a demolition permit since 2019, number of samples even, which could be pretty extensive, uh, and PCBs concentrations. And for those applicable structures with PCBs above 50 parts per million, you have to include some additional details, project address, demolition date, and then a brief description of the PCBs containing materials. Um, and then, uh, so for, for structures that were constructed or remodeled between the years of 1950 and 1980 um, and requires an emergency demolition, then you also have to provide some additional uh, uh, project specific information. And then there are a few new uh, things coming down the pike for 2024 and 2026. And so uh, we will need to have our municipalities um, reporting whether the site was inspected during demolition. So making sure that that piece of the program is being implemented. And then the process of uh, providing waste, the hazardous waste manifest where EPA is not uh, looped into that part of the implementation. And then for the uh, later uh, year in the permit, we will need to submit a, an effectiveness evaluation for the protocol on controlling PCBs and supporting data. And uh, on that note, I'll just say that the, um, the regulations stipulate that if the municipalities do this work, implement the programs, um, every year we will uh, be provided a, a two kilogram um, per year load reduction for doing this work, which is, is fairly significant for the PCBs TMDL. And so uh, that towards the end of the permit, there will be kind of a, a reassessment of the effectiveness of the program and kind of matching the numbers of uh, uh, concentrations and, and volumes of materials with that uh, two kilogram per year uh, waste load allocation uh, or late waste load reduction. So that's the end of my presentation, and I'm sure there are plenty of questions uh, for Miles and, and myself. I'm so happy to switch it over uh, to question mode and I'll stop my screen here. Come back to the group. Great. Thank you so much, Reed and Miles. Andy and Wills are going to facilitate us in this conversation. I've seen a couple of Q&A already, um, which is great. Feel free to also raise your hand and Andy or Will can call on you um, if you'd prefer to, to speak your question live. 
Thanks, Maria. I, I think I'm going to be taking the lead for the Q&A. So um, thanks to both of our speakers. Um, some very comprehensive overviews of some great guidance um, from the West Coast. Um, before, Heather, before I go to your question, I'm just going to highlight in the Q&A that Jess Hubrix has at, asked a question um, from Miles. They answered in the chat, but Miles, I'm wondering if you could just uh, give an overview of your response. So the, the question from Jess was about, you know, how uh, ecology and, uh, you know, how the how the recommendations have been received. So um, I'm wondering if you could maybe just reiterate your answer there. Sure. Yeah. Happy. Well, um, so, uh, yeah, we, um, uh, you know, at, we actually wrapped up into training on this project this summer. So those those training videos exist. And I forgot to mention that to everybody here. If they want to see a more thorough deep dive into the guidance, you know, those the, there's some video links we can send your way. So those are out there. Um, but uh, but yeah, we, we also as part of the proposal, we did talk to um, our EPA counterpart um, in Region 10. And um, yeah, I had, had, a, had a review of the document and uh, got some feedback. Uh, so there was some weight in, which was, which was really nice. But we have not taken that next step to pursue and look at the, the policy stuff yet. I know we received NEP funding for this guidance project, but uh, we currently uh, we currently don't have the approved resources to really carry this, this I guess, project into the next step. So um, we very much want to, uh, you know, uh, make room for that, hopefully in the near future. Um, but but part of the reason putting the proposal out there was for others to maybe, you know, uh, to also take hold of this. I know the, uh, just mentioned this, I think Seattle 30 project, uh, they are actually going to be doing some outreach here as part of their NEP funded project pretty soon, which is really exciting to see um, them promote that and and uh, approach businesses and some of that work. So um, so there's, there's angles that are going there. Um, but uh, but yeah, I, there will be some conversations hopefully real soon with with our with our folks at EPA to maybe talk about what what are some good next steps. It's just always tough because we're we're approaching them when they're also taking a regional and a national perspective here, not just Washington State. So, uh, but we're looking forward to those conversations soon. Great, thanks, Heather. Do you want to go ahead and unmute yourself and and chime in? Sure. Um, hi, everybody. Heather Trim with Zero Waste Washington in Seattle. Um, thank you both for your great presentations. And um, I do share the, this is not a, a question, but a comment on this thing, um, the concern about the 50 part per mil cutoff and that you're not going lower in both states, because I think you actually have authority to do that. But um, in terms of um, my question is, have you looked at or considered or where are you at in terms of recycling the material into new being reused and it, we want reuse and rebuilding and that kind of thing. So where does that play into your thinking? That, that's a good question. You want to go read? <laughs> you can go first. Yeah, I, don't, I don't have a response. It, it actually didn't come up during the development of the program. And it, it could just be that, you know, as things progress with the recycling industry and, you know, that we've seen some big changes in California with uh, recycling legislation, uh, which is great, not specific to the building industry, but, um, you know, I expect that that is something that will come up in, in future iterations of the program. We agreed kind of among the uh, municipalities and the regulators to start with a pretty low bar on the program uh, just to get it working properly. Um, but I think it's a, it's a really, you know, it's a really smart and um, important aspect that will probably be brought into future uh, programs, and it could take some legislation to kind of you know move us that direction. Um, and the one thing I was going to mention too is that really something that came out for us early on was that this would probably be better managed by a state uh, regulation and not a a stormwater permit that's implemented locally. And uh, you know there are good examples with asbestos and, and lead. Uh, in other on other pollutants, so why not do that with PCBs? Um, of course, that's politically challenging and could be you know fairly long process. But I think the entire um, you know the in, the benefits to the environment and public health would really uh, warrant that approach. So just wanted to state that. Yeah, and Heather, I think from my perspective too, I think the hard part is. Um, 
is just again the the reuse or recycling of materials or PCBs, you know, could be contaminating them. That's a yeah, it's a really tricky thing. And I have a feeling some materials that PCBs aren't being looked for are getting recycled, and PCBs aren't being accounted for in the system. So I think it needs to be looked at both ways. Um, uh, but we, have, as 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 Reed said, we we wanted to start at the proper management of materials at the construction site for source control. We hadn't really thought too much about the recycling reuse component of it. So definitely add that to the list. I think it's a good thing to think about for future stuff. Thanks. Um, maybe we'll take one from the Q&A tool here and and read just to sort of follow up on something that you, you just sort of mentioned. Heidi Siegelbaum has a question about, you know, what the city and the state um, have done to help build capacity and and maybe you could talk about whether there's been, you know, interest at that level to, you know, take some of the things that you're doing at the municipal level and scale it up. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I've not seen anything on this topic yet. Uh, we follow a, a different kind of thread of legislation pretty closely regarding emerging contaminants. Uh, related to stormwater, and there's been quite a lot, as as you all probably know, with uh, you know the uh, PFAS chemicals and PFOS, um, and there's a linkage to uh, stormwater. I haven't seen anything new on PCBs, um, and I, I would love to do that. You know, and we there's potential for our organization to sponsor legislation. So if it was you know if we were seeing that, um, for instance, there were not enough buildings coming through this program to uh, to really have the effect that we're looking for, um, or if it just seems like there are other justifications in terms of cost of implementation or consistency of regulations um, that would warrant a legislative process. I think that's something that uh, would be worth having discussions with um, with our state representatives, um, and we do have. Uh, pretty significant engagement with them on other topics. So uh, it might be something that I, you know, plant as a seed in future discussions with our state reps. Um, but for now, it does live within the municipal uh, regional stormwater permit, and it kind of stops there. So that's, you know, that's where things stand. Thanks. I don't know, Miles, if you want to add anything to to that from the Washington perspective. Um, yeah, you know, read, read pretty much, I think, conveyed a similar um, I guess mindset we're in. Um, yeah, it's a it, it is it's a it's a difficult um, it, it's a difficult subject, um, and I know I know um, moving moving forward, we're yeah we're trying to really understand kind of kind of what I guess what a good system could look like because I, I do think that the issue is so prevalent and uh, there's there's a lot of um, there like uh, we we uh, you know we're we're really interested in being protective, but. If uh, if requirements um, really come down hard, I know businesses individually suffer just because this is such a large scale issue to address on site. So um, so I, I don't know where we're trying to approach it methodically and understand both sides. And and again, you know, this just comes at, at our, our initial steps into this is we want to make sure there's proper guidance and proper tools to try to understand the scale of your potential issue. Um, even before uh, some of the some of the policy discussion, so I'm sorry. I hope, hope that answered it. But that's kind of I think the mindset we're in at the moment is is trying to have all that in place before really pushing forward on stuff at the state level. Yeah, great. Um, so I'm going to give Deb Deb Willison maybe a chance to unmute and and ask her question. Great, thank you. Um, this is my question for Reed, and this might be a little bit about what you're kind of just talking about. But I was wondering how businesses and the um, the sector that does demolitions, how they're receiving all of this, if they're finding um, it's it's the cost for them and is there incentives or grants or are you, how are you finding that reception and are you meeting resistance kind of thing? And, and how can we, is there ways to help those businesses um, to comply? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Deborah. Um, we, Try to engage the industry uh, through the development of the pilot program, kind of phase one under a prior permit. And uh, we did have fairly good representation from the, the building industry. Um, and as the program got started, uh, and that was with respect to kind of the, the monitoring uh, approach because the contractors would need to do the, the sampling themselves. Um, and regarding the cost and kind of representative sampling and so on. So we kind of got that feedback early on. 
Um, but we have seen some projects after implementation started uh, coming back and saying, what, you know, what is this? And this is very expensive. And, you, you know, these samples are not easy to, uh, to process and, um, you know, some significant pushback from uh, specific project representatives uh, and especially on large projects where they have applicable buildings. Um, so it, it's going to take, I think, some time before everyone is sort of in the know. And that's part of the problem, I think, of taking this uh, more local approach versus a, a bigger uh, statewide strategy. And that's just sort of the, the unintended consequence, I think, of going that route. Um, so I, I do think that the building industry kind of felt to some extent left out, perhaps not everyone was brought in. Um, and the, the uh, kind of outreach is limited to what the local municipalities are doing really. So it is just, you know, information on websites. It's not, you know, like nice videos and things maybe that uh, Miles is, is providing, which I think would be really helpful. Um, and there aren't necessarily grants um, to support this work or additional funding available to project sponsors to do this work. Um, and the cost could come in pretty high, especially if, you know, now they have to manage the waste a certain way, right? Uh, whereas they might not have had to have done that previously, um, which I think, you know, to the benefit of the environment and so on, it's worth doing that. And it's sort of just the tough, um, you know, thing to, to uh, take in with new regulations um, as we evolve with this. Uh, so, you know, we wanna, we wanna do the right thing, um, but um, yeah, I, I'm not aware of, you know, existing programs to kind of facilitate or incentivize um, doing more of the right thing with, uh, with funding and so on. Thanks, Reed. Uh, Marcus Aguilar, unmute and ask your question. Thanks. Uh, yeah, this question was for Miles. Like, I was just curious how um, how you all kind of identify and get notified about you know potential sites in the Puget Sound area because you know down here in Region Nine. Um, we work with the water board. And so that's kind of one of the ways the monitoring that they do. Um, and then also just like, you know, if a, if a property owner is, um, you know, doing some sampling and they, and they find PCBs, that's kind of the other way that they get, um, they kind of get into our, into our process and start working with EPA. So I was just kind of curious, like what is kind of the input mechanism for Puget Sound? Yeah, that's a great question, Marcus. Uh, there's a handful. I'm, I'm sure um, our EPA Region 10 um, contact could provide you a much clearer answer, but just a higher level, it's, it usually comes from um, city and local jurisdictions that are uh, working on different, um, different, I guess, uh, uh, like NIPTES discharge or stormwater permits. I know City of Seattle has actually uncovered quite a few They've, they've traced uh, PCBs to stormwater runoff um, and different catch basins for a lot of responsible businesses. And that's led to them engaging with those businesses and having them test and look for stuff. And then they'll they'll kind of get looped into EPA's world. Um, that, that's not it's not always cut and dry that way. I think sometimes uh, those businesses, um, it, it, it can be a challenge going from stormwater basin to what's actually on the property for local jurisdictions um, that's a it's kind of a kind of a huge thing but i know for sure it's uncovered some and then i also know there's large superfund sites where epa has either already had an active hand in and they've required pcb testing as part of that and it's uncovered a big issue with their demolition work so um so uh so yeah the, it, it's those are the two avenues i know the best um and and again it's, it's it's just leading to a very small fraction of the facilities that are potentially out there that have this issue going on um, and, uh, yeah, I'd be very interested, interested Marcus, on, on hearing more specifically on, on other things and how you've seen them come into your world. Um, yeah, yeah another, so. another really good, um, input or feed, you know, kind of a, a method to notify EPA has been the, the municipalities, um, when they do their stormwater, um, sampling. So when there's, when they're sampling their storm drains and they find PCBs that kind of helps them get on a more local level of figuring out okay like we have a source somewhere in this storm drain system and so then that kind of helps identify some of the sites more closely when they do those um i think they do like sampling you know every so many years they do like an inventory but gotcha. it's about it's about that municipality like 
knowing about the PCB program, testing for it, and then, you know, working with the state program and the regional program to like, let us know, hey, we, we have a potential site in this area. I appreciate that, thanks. Yeah. Maybe I'll just sort of follow up on that too, Miles, and ask whether, you know, um, during your talk, you sort of highlighted the fact that there's really no direct trigger for the evaluation of, you know, PCBs during the demolition process. Whereas with, you know, the program that Reed was highlighting, it's sort of baked in to the permit. Um, and so you talked a little bit about, you know, the evolution from the Washington perspective of what you're going to ask people to do is, has there been much discussion of sort of, you know, putting that trigger in more firmly into the, the process? Um, yeah, a little bit. Um, I, uh, um, and, and so, you know, the, the, usually I think most stuff has come through because of external triggers, like either EPA or a local county or jurisdiction has required a business to look for this stuff. Um, the, the independent trigger to get uh, for facilities to look for this themselves um, is, um, is again, a lot less tenable at the moment. Um, I know as, as us as not the authority for these materials, um, it really is up to EPA to set that uh, precedent. And, um, um, and again, it's, you know, they, they also have their, their priorities as well. So it's, it, it can be, it can be a, tr a tricky thing. Um, but when it comes to the authority of Tosca, we really do need to defer to EPA. I know on our end, um, the, we, we've talked about the water quality angle. I think that's something we're continuing to pursue. I know Reed has really did a great job presenting and talking about how, you know, um, his area has approached the issue. I think there's jurisdictions that could very easily do that in Washington state, but I do think it's also a very, um, again, labor intensive way to, to get at the angle, um, national thing would, it would ensure consistency, you know, ensure more stuff to, to happen. So, um, so I, I hope that answers your question. I think we have, we have continued dialogue open with EPA about the implications of this. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, we want to see action. We also don't want to see businesses go out of business because of this issue. And I, you know, we, we, I think we have to approach it in a very methodical collaborative way, but, um, uh, but but yeah, it, it really it really comes down to to um, to the authority of Tosca, which which we which we defer to when it comes to actual building materials. Um, when they become a waste, it's a different story. But if they're still in use, that's where that's where it defers to EPA. So I hope, hope that makes sense. Yeah, great, thanks. Um, Jess, do you want to unmute and sure ask your yeah. question? Yeah, thanks. Actually, it wasn't a question. I just wanted to uh, help out with that one a little bit. Um, so it's definitely. Um, I would say in the Puget Sound um, Superfund sediment cleanup site driven um, that has led to the identification of um, sources of PCBs. Um, and we do already have some language in our industrial stormwater general permit and in, a, uh, in Washington um, for sediment cleanup sites, um, sorry, for facilities discharging to sediment cleanup sites to collect um, a storm solid sample from their um, stormwater infrastructure every uh, once every five year permit cycle and get that analyzed for PCBs uh, and PAHs and some other things. And so um, the Department of Ecology's water quality program could look at those storm solid samples to identify potential sources, um, but those would be um, ISGP holders. Um, and then I wanted to say that our current, um, our draft 2020, our Washington draft 2024 um, municipal stormwater uh, permit, our MS4 permit um, is out for public comment now when we have, um, there is some language in there about PCBs in building materials in three different sections in the IDDE section, in the O&M section, and then also in education and outreach. And so that's another tool that, eco that ecology and the state are using. Um, and then I see Julianne, um, Julianne's hand raised, and I'm just going to give it over to her because she's been um, a great help to Seattle in the work that she's done with PCB detection dogs. Great. Good segue, Julianne. <laughs> All right. Let me turn my video on. Hi. Um, I'm going to introduce myself. My name is Julianne, and I'm, I'm here today. Mike Jeffers um, introduced me to the fact that this was happening, so he couldn't be here today, so I said I'd pop in and introduce myself. Um, I work with Field Lab, but I formerly worked for the University of Washington Center for Conservation Biology. Um, I'm now still working with University of Washington, but 
I was participating, I participated in a, a couple pilot studies with Seattle Public Utilities. And just to yeah talk about some of the solutions that have been explored, uh, Seattle's been really incredible about thinking outside the box. And um, so they approached uh, our program years ago asking if detection dogs could be used to trace PCB sources. So we did two uh, long-term studies um, testing that and uh, the results were really great. Um, so I, I traditionally work with detection dogs doing wildlife research. Um, so this was kind of a new area, but there's a lot of questions we're still, you know, wondering if we can address using detection dogs to source trace PCB um, contaminants, but the screening method of buildings is a really, um, it, it's, it's very effective and it's it's pretty darn easy for Jasper. Jasper is the detection dog that I work with. Um, so it it's a it's a way of streamlining the sampling efforts, which can save a lot of money. So going to a potential site, the traditional sampling method would be to you know sample lots of different sources, but the dog will go right to the source. So it really um, reduces the number of samples needed to confirm the source material at a building site and where the PCBs might be coming from. Um, we did a lot of testing and there's a very high um, success rate down to 0.1 parts per million for the dog to detect the odor of PCB. And um, some of these building sites have really strong um, high PCB levels. And in those cases, the dog will go right to the windowsill that is the cause of the issue. And so you identify the material that the dog is consistently pointing out and can very quickly uh, identify a potential issue that's causing runoff and um, going into storm drains. So talking about, yeah, doing the storm drain sampling, um, finding storm drains that are an issue, and then backing up and looking at the buildings around that area and running a dog through the, uh, doing a perimeter search of that area can quickly identify PCBs. So I just wanted to, yeah, introduce myself and one of the methods that has been explored, which I think is incredibly um, important for helping with the cost issues when it comes down to to all this. So yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks, Julianne, for giving that overview. It's a it's an extremely novel way to uh, screen uh, for PCBs, and it kind of gets us into you know thinking about buildings that are not just slated for demolition and and evaluating those materials at the time of demolition. So. Um, we only have maybe a minute or two left, but I wanted to know from, you know, Reed, whether, you know, in the in the context of this sort of regional monitoring program where you have a lot of, um, you know, supplemental data around PCBs coming out of the urban environment, you know, are you are you sort of considering areas that are less than that 50 ppm um, kind of threshold and 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 are you trying to sort of get at this sort of more broader characterization of PCBs and building materials in the urban environment? It's mm -hmm. a great question. Yeah, and I'm, I'm really happy that Julianne uh, shared her, her program and work on this. Um, we, I don't foresee that the regulations will change in terms of what's required for screening buildings into the program. Um, that might change in future, but I think that's, that's our standard for now. Um, but there are other PCBs requirements in our permit that are now looking at, uh, old industrial land use areas in particular and addressing PCBs in particular at a lower, uh, threshold. And so, um, you know, we have the source property abatement program program in cooperation with the regional board and NEPA uh, and DTSC to do abatements on high concentration source properties. But there aren't requirements necessarily through other agencies for sort of the moderate concentration PCBs um, uh, source properties. And, uh, and we're fairly sure that in many cases there could be overlap between a property that had old industrial uses with uh, PCBs on, on the property and barrels and so on um, and other equipment, uh, but also in the building stock, right, for those, for that vintage. And so um, I think, you know, we've talked to Julianne, actually, we've had some conversations uh, with her and other uh, regional reps from our area on a dog sniffing um, type program, a pilot program in the Bay Area. Um, and uh, we are working with our water board to kind of 
create uh, some control measure plans for those old industrial areas in particular. And I could see us doing something where maybe we link up uh, sediment and stormwater sampling in those areas with an enhanced um, source property identification process that could be using dog detection. So that would be kind of a nice marriage between those things. Um, and that's actually where uh, some grant funding, I think, would come in handy because there are funds available for, for that type of work. So, um, so yeah, yeah, maybe we'll, we may we'll have something like that in the future, not too far from now. Great. Well, I think we're up against our scheduled break time. I wanted to thank both of you guys for coming and, and giving such great talks this morning. Um, you know, you presented actually a lot of great reference material. If you have the time, I wonder if you could pop some links to, you know, particularly relevant documents in the chat for everybody. And um, yeah, thanks, Mary. Let's try this. Hi, folks. I'm uh, Carrie Hornbuckle. I'm at the University of Iowa. And I'm really happy to get the chance to talk to you all today. It's been super interesting so far. I'm going to talk about uh, concentration emissions of PCBs from school building materials. This work is a collaboration with the, with, uh, between the University of Iowa, uh, the Iowa Superfund Research Program, and I'm going to talk quite a bit about our collaboration with the state of Vermont. The Iowa Superfund Research Program is a multidisciplinary, multi-project research center funded by the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. I'm the director of the center and our center is focused on airborne PCBs and we have teams that study sources, exposures, toxicity, remediation and metabolism of PCBs. Overall, our research center, which has been funded since 2006 by NIEHS, um, uh, addresses the, the issues uh, described in this cartoon. We look at emissions of PCBs from sediments, uh, transformation of PCBs in the sediments, release from water to air, releases from urban areas, releases within buildings, especially school buildings, and how that affects humans, primarily through inhalation. We're particularly interested in um, adolescents and also metabolic processes and overall prioritization of the most important contributors uh, that PCBs um, provide to human health risks. So our center has five major projects. Three of them are uh, uh, biomedical projects addressing uh, aspects of uh, human toxicology and human exposure. Two of them are engineering projects. We are also have a set of support cores, including a, a group of statistician and data managers. We have a synthesis core that makes the PCB chemicals that we study in our experiments. We have an analytical core that measures PCBs. We train students and we also have a community engagement core because our work with communities has become centralized and more important as, we, as we've uh, progressed. In addition to directing the center, I also lead one of the projects called Sources of Airborne uh, PCB Conjures and I lead the analytical core. The analytical core, this is my lab, um, showing the two instruments that we use um, for PCB analysis. These are Agilent triple quad uh, GC tandem mass spectrometers, and we run um, measurements of uh, all the PCB congeners in human blood, urine, um, brain tissue, animal tissues from the laboratory, um, sediments, water, also microsomal. Um, we do metabolites. We do all kinds of PCB measurements in this uh, laboratory. Um, our major focus is serving the rest of the center, but method development is also a, a major activity of the, our whole center. I, don't, I love to talk about the development of methods, but today I'm going to talk about air sampling. And this is my favorite air sampler. After many years of uh, using active samplers, uh, we switched over to using passive samplers. I didn't invent this. This was invented by um, Tom Harner at Environment Canada, and he has been deploying this type of sampler, which is called a PUFF pass, which stands for po uh, polyurethane foam passive emission, passive air sampler. And he deploys these all over the world. Um, we adopted them for, for our use in about 2009 or 2010. Um, but one of the major things we had to do with this is figure out how to represent the volume of air. Okay, so these you put out in the environment and they 
collect PCBs by absorption onto the po clean polyurethane foam. You take it back to the lab and we analyze it for PCBs, but you don't really care about the PCBs that are on the foam. What you care about is how it represents the air uh, around that sampler over the time period that was deployed. And so the big question was, what is the volume associated with this so we could get a uh, a value that represents the air, not the foam itself. And that was a major focus of um, my lab and probably, I think, two and a half PhD student work in order to get a um, quantitative assessment of the volume associated with the deployment of these air samplers. And so we uh, also now, uh, for the model that we created, we offer this um, on the web. And this is uh, a picture of what that looks like. Um, it's called um, puffpassvolume.org. And if you go in here and you identify uh, the sample location, which you could identify by putting a marker on, on, on this map we have here, and the time period that the sample was deployed anywhere in the world, we use then um, NASA um, and other data in order to model the mirrorology all around the world. This is from Mira. And we use that in order to apply to our calibration that we had developed uh, with those mentioned PhD students. And then uh, the results are provided and we can also show uh, how the sample is behaving over time. So outdoors, air and wind speed changes a lot and that greatly affects the uptake rate of the uh, PCBs under the samplers. And also it comes to equilibrium after it's there long ago. And this report adapts for that. So um, you can see how the chemical is behaving on the sampler. But in any case, the result is um, accounts for that approach to equilibrium and provides the user with a volume associated with that uh, deployment. So that's for outdoor air, but indoor air is a different story. And we needed to develop a similar calibration for the use of the passive air samplers for indoors um, because we were running a human cohort study. Um, in this case, uh, we deployed samplers in indoors and calibrated this against active samplers and also developed a computational fluid dynamic model to, to under, better understand the flow of air within uh, an indoor space. And we learned a lot. Um, we examined two styles of the puff pass model and discovered they're both um, effective. Um, and the variation in uh, the behavior of the room, uh, the behavior of the air in the room is important, but not as important as you see it in outdoor air. So we're uh, actually more precise and more um, confident in our estimation of uh, volumes associated with the deployment of samplers indoors. So this human cohort study that I mentioned was, um, was led by Peter Thorns called ASOP, and it was designed to evaluate exposures of humans to airborne PCBs. And we, well, Peter's group record, re recruited mothers and children, adolescent children, in two communities, in Northwest Indiana and in rural Iowa. And we chose Northwest Indiana because we knew that the Indiana Harbor and Ship Canal is a source of PCBs and documented that in many studies. And we didn't know of any sources in this rural community. Um, and we, we, for both cohorts, uh, we collected blood samples from the mothers and the kids. We put air samplers in their homes, outside their homes. And for the kids, we also put them in the schools, inside and outside of the schools. And we did many other studies to um, better understand human exposure to airborne PCBs. Well, one of the first um, studies that we, we did identified that the concentrations of PCBs in the schools was high. And that was a big surprise to me. And this paper published in 2017 um, summarized our deployments of uh, P of uh, passive air samplers inside and outside of six schools. And we redeployed and redeployed for about three years. And we found that the concentrations inside the school were much, much higher than the concentrations immediately outside the school. Um, they're about by about two orders of magnitude. And this difference was greater than we observed for the home air. 
Um, and um, the congener pro profiles we found were very interesting because at each school, the profile stayed the same, although the actual concentration magnitude changed over the course of the year, although not in a predictable way. Um, and so we had this hypothesis that that difference between schools in their congener distribution was related to different sources of PCBs in each of those schools. So we became more interested in what is it that's contributing to high levels of PCBs in schools and, and how could we better identify them? Meanwhile, um, Peter uh, asked his cohort community questions about their daily life. And one of those set of uh, surveys he asked was what they ate. And so he found what the people in, in, in our East Chicago cohort and our rural Iowa cohort were eating. And then we went to their grocery stores, we bought their food and we analyzed the PCBs in our, in our laboratory. And as you might expect and has been shown historically, fish have the highest concentration of PCBs with salmon having having the overall highest average, but tuna being close behind. Um, our, our cohort communities were not uh, wealthy. Um, they didn't actually eat much fish. And the fish they did was mostly uh, tuna, not salmon. Um, and so we used the information about how much and what they exactly ate on a conjure specific basis was able to then compare the exposure of the cohorts from food and from inhalation. And we found both to be highly variable. Um, most of the variability we can't predict or don't know why it is, but overall, the order of magnitude is similar between dietary exposure and inhalation exposure, especially for children. And that was because the concentration of PCBs in the air schools was so much higher than other uh, exposures. Okay, I'm gonna try to run this video. Morning, my name is Moala Banaki, and I'm here to tell you how and why we need to get PCBs out of our kids' school air. So you may not have noticed, but I'm a black woman, and I grew up in a town with a lot of other underrepresented minorities, and we were all from lower income families. I could tell you all about the ailments of going to a school like this, but Above all else, there were some problems that we couldn't even really see, and I didn't find out about until we got to graduate school, such as PCBs in school air. Polychlorinated biophenols, hereafter known as PCBs, are a category one human carcinogen, meaning that they cause cancer, they disrupt your hormones, they're just horrible, and they're found in the air everywhere. The reason why we focus on PCBs in schools is because PCBs are known to accumulate in the blood over a person's lifetime. So it's important we get in there and get them out while people are young and kids spend most of their time during the day inside school buildings. So why specifically minority predominant lower income schools, you might ask? Well, PCB remediation as it stands is super expensive. It took the New York City School District over a billion dollars to remediate PCBs in their schools and would take the average school hundreds of thousands of dollars. And minority predominant lower income schools just don't have that kind of money. That's where my research comes in. The goal of my research is to make PCB remediation cheaper, thus making it more equitable and accessible for all school districts, making sure that more of our kids are healthy. How we do that is we go into each classroom in a school and measure the overall PCB concentration in the air, and we get a signal like the one you see here. Then we go back into the classroom and we measure the same thing on the material using robust analytical chemistry methods that could tell you the difference between an elephant and an elephant with a speck of dust. When all is said and done, we're able to compare the PCB signals from the material to that of the overall room concentration. And then we're able to see which material contribute most. We can take out those specific materials instead of tearing down the entire school, which makes things a lot cheaper and that means that more schools would be able to do it. So what do we know thus far? That rooms that were built before PCBs are outlawed have a higher concentration than rooms built after, and that there's a higher concentration indoors than there is outdoors. So it's good that we're looking inside the classroom when we're trying to solve this issue. All in all, we're hoping that 
targeted materials remediation, which is what I just described to you, will help to make CCD remediation more equitable and accessible for all school districts, meaning that all of our kids get a better chance at being healthy. Thank you. All right. Um, I did forget to put on the, uh, whoops, let me get that up there. Put on the advanced, the better video. So maybe Mariel can it put it It came the through and I dropped the link in the chat as well. So we should be good. Great. Well, that was Moala Benafti. She's a um, Dr. Benafti now. She finished her PhD in Maine. She's now a postdoc at MIT. She her her words reflected the feeling of all of us as we are doing this work in these uh, in these schools. We were getting alarmed about this, and so Moala dedicated her PhD work to further examining the behavior of airborne PCBs in schools. Um, one of her studies, she put air samplers in uh, several schools or several rooms within one school to better understand how they vary in different environments within a school. And this is her publication. Um, she found that the concentrations of PCBs in one school varied a lot. And the biggest variation was room to room, indicating the likelihood of different sources um, across rooms. Overall, she did find that rooms that were built during the PCB era or older had the highest concentration. In fact, she found that the oldest schools that were built far before the 1950s had the highest concentrations. We hypothesize that that's because they did remediation during the PCB era. Um, and it, each of the concentrated distributions in each room was different, giving a, an, us a hint about what was the contribution of uh, and what was the source in that environment. Meanwhile, we started to think harder about how we could identify the specific sources through our measurements. And we invented a new passive sampler, polyurethane foam passive emission sampler. So it works very similar to uh, an air sample. It's, it's got the same material, polyurethane foam, but we place it in a um, Petri dish, a glass or Pyrex Petri dish. It fits really snugly in there. And then you can put it up against the surface and then there's a little air gaps to, to indicate or to, to convince us that we're measuring the gas phase emissions off of the surface, not what, not pulling off or removing it from, from the surface uh, in a solid form. And we applied this to a couple studies, one looking at the emissions of uh, PCBs from modern paint, because a small amount of PCBs are present in brightly colored uh, paint because of the chemical manufacturing process. Similarly, we used it to show that uh, polymer resin on, that's used on kitchen cabinet finishings also has a small amount of PCBs that are emitted when the, when the uh, finish is new. So we applied this then um, to a study in a built University of Iowa building that was contaminated with PCBs. Previous measurements had shown the air concentrations were high. And while the study here was to look at uh, several rooms within that building, evaluating the relative contributions of all of the available surfaces. Um, in this particular building, it was an interesting study because the air concentrations are high, even though the windows had been replaced and the, and the caulking had been removed. Uh, in this study, we found that um, there's strong evidence of continuing uh, secondary emissions. And um, the, you in the EPA uh, and regulatory community are well aware of this, but then after emission from a primary source, the PCBs accumulate all around on all the other surfaces. And we found indeed that if you wipe the surface, we reduce the emissions from surfaces about 60%. Um, in this, we think that that, that contribution was uh, now the major contribution and that the PCBs continue to recirculate because of deposition and re-release from all the surfaces in the room. Okay, so the US EPA doesn't regulate airborne PCBs in schools, even though it's known that children are the most among the most vulnerable populations. But Vermont does, and we'll have a couple speakers later talking about that. But as a result of Vermont's decision to take action on airborne PCBs, we've had a new opportunity to understand sources of airborne PCBs in schools. So um, 
I think as it will be described more in a bit, um, Burlington High School discovered high concentrations of airborne PCBs and it resulted in a decision or contributed to a decision by the community to tear down the, the high school um, and it still hasn't been, been rebuilt yet. Um, then be, probably uh, because the rest of the state wondered what other schools uh, had this problem, uh, the legislature passed a law that required measurements of airborne PCBs in all their schools built before 1980. Um, and they then began to uh, um, bring on consulting firms to, to do that work. In 2022, they brought us on to provide congener specific measurements. And since then, we've uh, worked in 19 Vermont schools and collected more than 500 samples. Today, I'm gonna talk about um, our first publication from our work in the Vermont schools. Um, and this is a application of the same methods that I've talked about so far. We used uh, the polyurethane foam passive air samplers and the puff pests, the emission samplers in all of these schools. And our overall approach was that first we would ev evaluate any available information. If a previous consultants had measured total PCBs, we had that. Um, we had uh, schematics of the school and some, some indications from previous work, what, what might be the sources. And then we'd go to the school and we'd look around and we'd spend a couple hours just sort of thinking about what's going on in the school. And then we'd place our air samplers and emission samplers and then a month later, they would be retrieved, sent back to Iowa, and we'd uh, extract and analyze them um, by GCMSMS. As we got the results, we would immediately share them back with, um, with the Vermont uh, DEC group, and if the school was interested also with them, on what our qualitative findings are. Then we'd provide draft reports and then provide a full report uh, to Vermont and alert the school of its availability. It resulted in many interesting conversations um, with the school building um, officials. So this is the school I'm gonna talk about today. And this is that first meeting at the school where we're just looking around um, uh, with the Vermont DEC official thinking about what's going on. Um, over time, as we've done this work, we've attracted other visitors too. Here's um, a photographer hired by Monsanto. Here's a, another photographer hired by Monsanto. And here's another hi photographer hired by Monsanto. Um, they have chemical engineering degrees and PhDs, and they're taking pictures of us placing our samplers in schools. This is Jason Hua. He's a PhD student who's been the major uh, player, major uh, contributor to our work in, in Vermont. And he's the one who's doing all the analysis. Um, he has a team of other students that he supervises on all of that. So this is a preliminary result that we would give back to the, to the school and to Vermont. As soon as it comes off the GC, we can tell uh, from our mission samplers the order of it um, because they're all deployed at the same time. So we could just take an eyeball look and we're like, oh, Okay, the highest one was the emission sample we put on these glass blocks. The next highest was the one on brick walls and the cinder block walls, on the tile, on the wallboard, on the cove base, on the carpet. And uh, then we would prepare a more extensive um, report. And this is a front page of one of those reports um, showing what types of samplers we deployed in that school and where. And uh, this schematic shows where we deploy the samplers and which, which kind, emission samplers and air samplers. And in this particular school, we were only doing the part of the school that had been, been built during the PCB era, which previous uh, reports from Vermont's consultants suggested to be high. The air samplers we deployed, we, we intended them to be triplicates. And the emission samplers were intended to be representative of the materials that dominated the surface area in the school. And then we would report the um, total PCBs, the sum of the 209 congeners uh, as a summary slide. And, and here's our air concentrations and here's our emission concentrations. Glass blocks in this case contributed much, much more uh, or, uh, to room air 
in emissions than all the other um, all the other emissions that we measured in this particular room. Then we also provide, of course, lots of quality control data, including our blanks, which sit there on the site for the same 30-day period. And then we use uh, 10 different uh, C13 labeled surrogates that are added to every sample uh, to that we use then to evaluate our precision. Um, then the data itself is also transmitted. In the case of the paper I'm talking about today, um, we published all the data from those emission and air samplers um, in a publicly available data repository, which uh, anyone can get in, and we hope people do use this data. So the concentrations of emissions off of glass blocks really surprised me. Maybe it doesn't surprise some of you. Maybe you're aware of this, but I did not think that that would be a, uh, a place that PCBs were used. Um, to me, it looked like mortar in between those blocks. And uh, there must maybe some bit, been also some sealant, some caulking, but this um, room was built in 1958. And so it's been emitting PCBs for all of that time at very high levels. And you can imagine how much higher those emissions will be when it's hot, when they, uh, the sun is blazing in on, on, the, on these windows. And you can imagine exactly where that goes into the schoolroom. But I didn't realize um, that there would be such a difference in the concentrations within the room. Uh, these three air samplers were placed in the same room as the glass blocks. This one you can see is, you know, not super close, but closer cl is the closest air sampler to the glass blocks this is in the middle. And this is furthest away. And the range of concentrations goes 96 to 180 nanograms per cubic meter. The closer the air sampler was to the glass blocks, the higher the air concentration. And um, yeah, well, so it's not a triplicate. It's because room air is not well mixed. In fact, these are ind indicative of, of the range of concentrations and probably doesn't capture the whole range that exists inside the schoolroom. So the emissions from the glass block um, we expected to look uh, the conjure distribution to look like one of the aerochlor mixtures, and indeed it does. It looks a lot like 1254, but it doesn't look exactly like 1254. In the paper, we detail all these a different variety of hypotheses we had about why it doesn't look exactly like 1254, and 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 one one of the findings is that. Um, it doesn't look exactly like 1254 because of differential volatility in the congeners. The lowest molecular weight congeners are released faster and than the higher ones. And this is the change in the relative abundance um, that we see in the emissions relative to what's in Aerochlor 1254. And the one we found, the 1254 lot that's most similar is the one that was reported by Rushnik in 2004. So um, once we did this, then we could we we decided to quantify this, and we created a mathematical model to evaluate this. And we our model is conceptualized around a, a series of um, layers in the solid material, whatever that is in the glass blocks, and a series of layers in the puff. And we model then the diffusion between all of these layers, the diffusion to air, and the uptake in the puff. And we ran it, or we, we simulated for the same 30 days as our sampler exists. And this is the difference that's predicted uh, just due to, to that differential release from between the original aerochlor and the predicted aerochlor. And surprisingly, this prediction of the emissions distribution matched very well what we actually measured. And I say surprising because it's been there since 1958. And I kind of expected to see some weathering in the solid material between the glass blocks, but there's no evidence of that. In fact, it just looks like we would predict due to um, uh, differential diffusion from the solid to the air. We used uh, cosine similarity as one of the statistical methods to quantify this um, observation. And what I'm showing here is the the statistical strength uh, quantified through uh, uh, cosine theta of uh, between the emissions from different materials in the room, 
um, and different formulations of aerochlorus. And we found the Rushnik air, uh, reported aerochlorus uh, were the best overall. And yes, it looks a lot like the Rushnik 1254, but it looks even more like the modeled emissions of Rushnik 1254. And that get, gave us a very good match across all the conjugate distribution we observed in this particular school. Okay, so just like Moala described to you, I also was, you know, I'm really getting concerned. The concentrations of PCBs in school areas high, and I think that that's not well understood, and I don't think it's under, well understood the risk that poses to children. And so I wrote an opinion piece that ESNT published, and today my conclusions are sort of reflective of, of that opinion piece. First of all, schools are a big uh, PCB exposure scenario. And the PCBs are not banned from use in schools. They are still there, even though all the schools we've studied so far uh, have had the light ballast removed, the other materials are still major contributors. PCB in school air is not decreasing until that material is removed. It will continue to be a source as long as it's there. And air is, in fact, a really important exposure route, similar to diet. And it depends on the person, right? How much, what you eat and how much time you're spending in the school. And PCBs also, that our, our center has shown clearly that PCBs are not just carcinogens, but they're also neurotoxins, especially associated with nervous and anxiety behaviors, including ADHD, we'll typo there. Also, PCB metabolites are important contributors to toxicity, and I didn't talk much about that today, but that's a very important consideration when we're using um, blood to estimate people's exposure. What we need to be looking for is the metabolites. For the lower molecular weight conjures, which are found in air, they are converted to metabolites very quickly. And these lower molecular weight PCBs are not harmless. The reason we don't see them in um, bioaccumulation studies is, is partly because they're metabolized to other chemicals and those other chemicals have their own toxicological profile. Lastly, um, the problem that, that every school brings up to me when I talk about it is how they're going to pay for it. So Superfund legislation does not provide any support for PCB removal in schools. So who, who's going to pay for this and how can we reduce children's exposure in the future? I want to thank um, Vermont for um, deciding to conduct this study. I'm sure that we'll have many interesting findings, and I, I look forward to talking more about those in the future. Thanks. I'm Trish Coplino, Senior Program Manager for Sites Management Section, Vermont DEC. I think um, everyone knows this. We can skip through what PCBs are, how much they are made, and that they're made by Monsanto. Um, why should we be testing for PCBs in schools? So um, a lot of this carry went over, but they're in almost all of our building materials that were built um, for buildings built before 1980. We have high PCB exposures to children that can have some of the most health effects. They become one of the largest sources of PCB impacts to students and staff. And in Vermont, um, we found some of the highest levels at Burlington High School when they were getting ready to do a renovation. So Burlington High School, very quickly, um, they they ended up reporting a spill to us. So this came in as a spill um, when we started working through the process and moving towards indoor air sampling. Um, we found that the highest concentrations in indoor air were 6,300 nanograms per cubic meter. Um, this all happened right before um, we were ready to come back to school after COVID. We found these results, and then the day after we closed, we didn't. The, the school closed again. So, a lot of um, work going into this to try and figure out sources and issues. We can go to the next slide. Um, since Burlington High School is one of our largest schools and from the largest city in our state, there was a lot of attention paid towards. Um, this and concerns about what's happening in our other schools. So our legislature took this initiative forward. So in 2021, um, the largest thing that happened, and for any states that are listening, um, they changed our definition of release. Um, in the past, we regulated all um, environmental media, soil, groundwater, indoor air, but we never regulated releases coming from building materials. And so that's how they changed the definition of release 
to make this a regulatory program now. So they said basically the intentional or unintentional action or emission resulting in the spilling, leaking emission or disposal of PCBs from building materials in the building or structure. So for us, this meant now if there is a detection of PCBs in indoor air that we were able to regulate these releases. So the, the legislature did that. They provided um, DEC with four and a half million dollars to start funding the work at the schools that would be sampling all schools that were built or renovated before 1980. And then in 2023, they provided funding for assessment and cleanup that would be 100% reimbursable um, through our agency of education. They provided us $29 million. 13 million was for all the schools in the state that are going through this program. 16 million went directly to Burlington. So um, we had to kind of hit the ground running because the legislature gave us this time frame of starting in 2021 and finishing in 2024, which meant that we had to create a team and figure out how to actually build a program to do all of this sampling. Um, and then what do we do if we find PCBs? So it wasn't a very quick fix for us um, just to go out there and start doing the sampling. Um, in the end, we had this team working on everything. So for DEC, I have nine project managers that are working on this along with all of their other projects um, in the state of Vermont and then Department of Health, um, Agency of Education, and we partnered very closely with the EPA Region 1 program. Um, so how are we doing this? What did we design? So basically, um, since there is a release mechanism now based on statute, um, we have oversight for all the steps in the process once a PCB release is detected. Um, and we start sampling each school. So we asked the Department of Health in order to do this, we need standards for indoor air. So the Department of Health derived um, school action levels and immediate action levels for us to use when PCBs are detected. And Dr. Owen's gonna go over more of that later. Um, but ultimately we're trying to make sure that we can keep PCB levels and indoor air as low as possible. Um, our SALs indicate the release that something needs to happen. And the IALs are, are there to show us that there's um, something more important that needs to happen and that space shouldn't be used until we can reduce indoor air concentrations. Um, we try to eliminate the use of rooms where we have a, a sample, where samples exceed the IAL. Um, we limit the amount of time in the space used. And we've also been deploying a lot of mitigation measures um, in the spaces to try and make sure we can keep schools operating as best as they can while we work through the process. Um, this is really what our program looks like and all of the work <laughs> that we had to do to um, to get this program off and running. Um, it was not a small undertaking um, and, and it continues to um, evolve over time. These are our school action levels. And like I said, Dr. Owen is gonna go over these in more detail. Um, we have three different school action levels for the different age groups. Um, and then our immediate action levels. How did we start the program? We identified all the schools in the state by sending a survey out to all the schools. So we knew how many of them were built or renovated before 1980 because this data was not available to us. Um, we set a schedule up to prioritize the schools based on free and reduced lunch, age of building construction um, and um, the age of the students and whether or not they had any renovations planned, HVAC or school renovations. We assigned consultants and staff um, to each school district and private school so they would have a consistent consultant and a consistent um, uh, project manager at the state to work with. Um, DEC hires consultants. They go to each school, they coordinate with the school, they do an inventory of the school and within this inventory, they go into every single space in the school and they identify any potential PCB causing building material that may exist. Um, they look at this data, they group all of this information together into, into groups of like and unlike um, spaces. So construction, HVAC, um, paint, tile, carpet, whatever it is, they group all of that information together um, with, with spaces, and then they provide us with an indoor air sampling work plan to conduct the work. DEC pays for that work. 
Um, <clears throat> these, the request that we have of consultants is that they sample 30% of all the rooms in each group. So if a group has 10 rooms, they collect three indoor air samples. Um, and we use that data, Health uses that data to help evaluate what kind of occupancy options we can provide them. Um, DEC reviews, evaluates all the indoor air data, and then we send it over to health um, to evaluate and provide um, occupancy option letters that we send to the school. Um, after we get the occupancy option letter, the team meets with the school to go over all the data. Um, we provide the school with letters to send out to their community, one in advance of the sampling and one after the sampling event happens that shares the information with the community. We have them translated into seven or eight different languages. Um, and then we provide opportunities for the state group to meet with the community and the staff at the school to go over the data and next steps. If there are detections found in the school above the SAL, um, they are now in the regulatory framework of the state. They need to hire a consultant to conduct the work that um, exists, which is identifying the source of the PCBs, determining the degree and extent of that source of PCBs, and then going through the remediation process. All of that work is 100% reimbursable by the state of Vermont through the Agency of Education. <clears throat> this is what one of our inventory groupings look like from a school. So they look at the, the group, the construction year, some of the information that's there, the number of rooms, proposed samples. We get volumes and volumes of Excel data from the consultants for each school. This is another example, um, looking at what the materials are that they're identifying. This is what a grouping looks like at a school. So this is Bellas Falls Union High School um, and how all of the groups were put together for this school and then the sampling that would have happened associated with it. Um, so like I mentioned, we asked the consultants to sample 30% of the spaces in each group. The sampling that we came up with in order to achieve the SALs and make sure that we were getting good data was a 24 hour sampling event using TO10A with a five liter per minute um, maximum, um, minimum <laughs> of the sampling pump, uh, EPA method 8082 and a reporting limit of 10 nanograms per cubic meter um, or below. This is what the sampling um, instrument looks like if you haven't seen one. Um, the top is the glass container with the puff sampler inside of it and the pump is sitting on the floor. And this is where most of our samples, what most of our samplers look like. This is Carrie already went over this, but same thing, um, help us identify the source of PCBs in a space. We're really excited to be working with the University of Iowa. They've definitely helped us move forward some of the prospect, the projects where we don't have to do the looking for the needle in the haystack approach of um, sampling every single building material, but help us focus on it. And in this case, um, we helped fund the removal of the windows um, in the school. Um, and we're waiting for the confirmation results back to let us know that we've achieved indoor air standards we're looking for. This is what uh, the funding looks like for um, most of our projects. Um, we haven't gone to a cleanup yet, but that's a probably relatively close assumption of what it could be. Um, so when we talk about mitigation, we're talking about different ways to make sure we're reducing indoor air concentrations while we continue to do the work at the school. So we increase ventilation. Um, we've been providing a lot of air filtration, so activated carbon filters. We have a contract with a company out of Canada and they deliver the filters directly to the school. Uh, the Bellis Falls School, which I showed you earlier, we, um, we shipped 118 uh, carbon filters to them to help reduce indoor air concentrations at their school. We can go to the next slide. So when we're looking at remediation, so this is the part after we've identified the sources, um, we've agreed to the corrective action plan and we have a process in place now where we can have a streamlined cleanup approach and relatively uh, good approval process between the state and EPA to try and move these forward. 
um, we can work on um, removing and remediating the schools, um, looking at removal, um, looking at disposal of schools or isolating and encapsulating the PCBs. Um, so any work that needs to happen at the schools is um, reviewed and approved by DEC, and then it is um, reimbursed by the agency of administration or agency of education. So this is what most people really want to know from us: how many schools and what are we finding? Um, so there's a total of 324 schools. The way you can look at this is um, where inventories have been approved, that means we received a work plan and I've approved the cost to move it forward. So 160 schools so far for inventories, it's 49% of the schools that we need to work through. The same thing with the number of indoor air testing, it's 116 approved so far. So 36% of those schools have gone forward with indoor air sampling. Um, results have shown that there are 31 schools so far that have a, a school action level exceedance. Um, there are 13 schools that have had indoor air um, uh, media action level exceedance and 59 schools that have results all below the school action level for that school. And then some of the building material data and indoor air data. So some of our indoor air results have ranged between 600 nanograms per cubic meter to 880, that's at Bellis Falls Union High School. And some of the results of the building materials are astounding. So spray and fireproofing has been one of the larger ones for us, but 33,000 parts per million um, concentration of PCBs, cove mastic, duct mastic, or coatings, expansion joints have been a big one. You can see down at Pulteney Elementary, 107,000 in an expansion, expansion joint location. Window caulking has also been really high. Um, Greenmount High School has a 4, 460,000 parts per million in window caulking. So really, really high concentrations in some of these PCB building materials that are definitely contributing to indoor air concentrations at these schools. So what have we learned? <laughs> a lot. Um, I guess most importantly, um, we really need to do a good job communicating with the schools and with the communities and our upper management and the legislature. And sometimes the simplest um, communication is the best communication. Always budget for more time. Always budget for more money. Um, build strong teams and good um, support systems. Um, you might find something in a school that's not PCBs. We, we found chlorinated pesticides also um, that we weren't expecting to find, but we did. Um, uh, build a program that can grow and change. It's always good to be able to, um, to do that, knowing that you'll find new things and new ways to do things. Um, let's see, and we have a lot more to do. So. I guess those are all the things we're learning. I have a lot of references here that you'll all be able to have access to, um, mostly our websites and where you can find information related to the work we're doing. So I wanna make sure you have plenty of time for Dr. Irwin to explain the other half of our program. To start, um, I'm the state toxicologist and as Trish has explained, we developed a program to evaluate PCBs in the indoor air of schools. So it's been a busy couple of years. So we started with the science, um, looking at what we know about PCBs and how they can affect our health. Um, you know, unfortunately, PCBs are very toxic chemicals with 209 different chemicals. You've got a lot of research, a lot, a lot to look through, and Dr. Hornbuckle went through some of that. Um, they can definitely increase our risk of getting cancer. EPA has classified them as probable human carcinogens. Other agencies have also um, characterized them as carcinogens. They also have some very serious non-cancer health effects. And when we think about exposure for shorter durations, um, you know, up to one year of exposure, these non-cancer health effects become uh, very concerning. So these non-cancer health effects are um, things that have been showed certainly in animal studies, but these are also very well supported in human studies. So uh, human data to support impacts on the immune system, reproductive system. Um, so exposure to PCBs can reduce uh, children's birth weight. Um, we can have effects on the developing nervous system. And this is of course of really great concern when you've got people of childbearing age who can be exposed to PCBs. We know that PCBs have a really long half-life in our bodies as well. And so the combination of developmental neurotoxicity and long half-lives can make us pretty concerned for exposures during those elementary or high school years. 
And we know that PCBs can also affect our thyroid hormones, which again, can be very important for normal development. So in terms of health effects, um, we were pretty concerned about what we were seeing in the literature. Uh, this is one of Dr. Hornbuckle's papers, and I, I just put this up to, to illustrate the point that PCBs in schools can really represent the greatest source of exposure for, for children and for staff there. So this is a paper looking at the outdoor air levels near one of the Superfund sites, New Bedford Harbor, where a lot of manufacturing uh, was taking place, or at least the disposal of some manufacturing was taking place. And the air there was 39 nanogram per meter cubed. And you've probably seen this in a couple of different presentations, but the highest level in the Burlington High School was 6,300 nanogram per meter cubed. Uh, this is a level that is obviously much higher than what's found at these very well-funded Superfund cleanup sites. So we, we have some real reasons to be concerned about exposures at schools. Uh, so just moving on to, um, let's see, sorry, uh, I'm going to move on to more of the framework that we developed in, in 2013, the health department did develop a screening level for PCBs and in indoor air. And those of you who work in the risk assessment fields will know that screening levels are always health-based. We use very uh, basic equations, you know, similar to what EPA does in their RSL table. Uh, this isn't a perspective that is often portrayed in, in some of the media. So sometimes Vermont's, you know, the stories that come out uh, have various headlines, but our, our screening levels are actually very close to, we follow the EPA process and our screening level of 15 nanogram per meter cubed is quite close to what EPA publishes in their RSL table. Um, the difference there is that the five nanogram per meter cubed from EPA is for residential 24 seven. And with a school exposure scenario, we have, you know, we, we don't live at school. Um, Trish has mentioned the school action levels. These are risk management levels and they do range from 30 to 100. EPA also has non-regulatory ELEs that range from 100 to 600. The, uh, the, the main reason for that difference is that EPA, well, there are a few different reasons, but EPA uses a central tendency exposure. So they use average exposures, uh, for example, six hours a day in school. We typically use a reasonable maximum exposure for all of our risk assessment work, and that's, that's what we've done here. So we have a longer day for our students and staff at schools. And Trish also mentioned the immediate action level. Uh, those are what we developed here in Vermont, they're three times higher than the school action level. And we, we sort of loosely base that off of the EPA RML, the remedial management levels. I think I got the R right. Um, but that's, those are the EPA levels that help guide some of their actions that are based on a hazard index of three. Yeah, so we, we set that screening level back in 2013 when we did a pilot study of just a few schools. And when we started thinking about this regulatory program and testing schools statewide in Vermont, DEC, Trisha's group, did a lot of work on background. So what is, what is considered background levels for PCBs in indoor air? Maybe PCBs were there previously, maybe they got removed, there can be secondary sources, and for various reasons, it can be really hard to get below uh, background, which was DEC decided was 22.5 nanogram per meter cubed. So that information was really helpful as we went into our process to, to develop these school action levels because we wanted the action levels to represent indoor air concentrations where, where action could be taken. So we didn't want to send schools on a wild goose chase looking for sources that were really should be contributed to background. So just a bit more about the school action levels. So they they are different from the screening level. So there was a lot of confusion that, you know, we always start with a screening level, then we come out with school action levels, which have a different purpose. So communicating that concept, we try every chance we get, and there's still a lot of misunderstanding about that uh, both in schools and the general public. 
Uh, but communicating that those are risk management levels, uh, I think is really important. So we followed EPA's process. EPA, you know, I mentioned EPA has ELEs. Those are guidance levels for schools for indoor air. Indoor air. And EPA developed a PCB exposure estimation tool. It's abbreviated PEET, P-E-E-T. And that tool does a really nice job of estimating all the different sources of PCB exposure. And using the non-cancer reference dose, the PEAT tool subtracts all of the background exposure and then gives you the rest of that reference dose to be attributed to school indoor air. I mentioned that we use different exposure assumptions. So we use 235 days a year, which can include summer school. We use 9.75 hours a day. We also account for the background air exposure differently. So instead of just um, using the very few data points we have for PCBs in the home, we set that to zero and we account for exposure at schools based on the time. So 9.75 hours a day uh, over 24. So I mentioned these are risk management levels. We typically, with screening levels, we like to stick to one in a million cancer risk. We know that these uh, these school action levels are have a greater cancer risk than one in a million. The greatest cancer risk for the staff who's there for 30 years is about six in a million. And that is something that, that we can live with. We do have a much longer publication and the link is there. So if, if that's something you want to read about, you can find all the information about the school action levels there. We also developed this occupancy framework. And, and this is what helps us to balance the reality that, yes, PCBs are really toxic chemicals. They shouldn't be in our school. We don't want them in our school and we need to reduce exposure. So we have to balance that with keeping schools open because in-person learning is really important. So we developed this framework to give schools lots of different options or three different options to evaluate what they can do in the very short term. So a school, you know, we get the data first, we prepare this letter for the school that outlines their three temporary occupancy options. And so this gives the school, it helps them to react to this data in the days and weeks following the receipt of the data, because you have a lot of interested and concerned parents. Um, so this really, we found that this has been really helpful to give them these somewhat canned options. You know, we, we do this consistently across all, we apply the same framework to all schools. Some schools need sort of site specific work, but that's, that's really not the case. The actual framework, um, I will point you for the sake of time to this uh, document. So we do publish a lot, but it's basically three different ways to reduce risk. So you've got the most restrictive options for lowest risk. And if, if that works for a school, we suggest they use that. If that doesn't work for them, we suggest they move on to option two, which is greater use of some of those untested rooms. If that doesn't work, we suggest that they move on to option three, which is more, the most use of rooms. Um, we do support all these options uh, and we go to community meetings. Um, that's basically all that this slide says. You know, we meet with every school, we go to public meetings, we spend a lot of time traveling around the state. Uh, this gives you a quick snapshot of what that framework look, looks like when a school gets the letter. So there's kind of a lot going on here, but you can see that there's the room listed, the group is listed the result is listed, and then you have the three options. So in this, this would be a letter that would go to a school that does have the three, the three different age groups because you have three different action levels based on age, and that's because of diet. Uh, you do have the three different um, sets of advice. So we translate this into a use, not use framework so that schools can look at this and they might say, well, under option one, we really can't keep our school open without use of those rooms in group 13. So we're going to use option two. So this, we try to make it sort of simple for the school to look at and decide what their next steps are. And that's all. Awesome. Thank you. Such a wonderful wealth of information. Um, Greg, I know you were going to help facilitate our Q and A for the second half of the discussion and there's certainly a lot in in the q a feature itself but while greg is taking a look at that 
Um, I, I've seen a couple of questions that get to kind of the role of air filtration. And I know you all talked about the, the carbon filters that you've been using. Can you speak a little bit more to kind of the magnitude and when that's a good fit and when that's not? Sure. So um, we've definitely been relying on carbon filters to help reduce indoor air concentrations. Um, I would say 95% of the time they've been very effective for us, especially in classrooms. The larger spaces like gymnasiums and auditoriums has been a little more difficult for us um, just based on um, having the right uh, air exchange happening. Um, but we did work through different calculations so that we could identify the number of air filters to put into the spaces. And for the most part, um, we've seen great reductions um, from concentrations in classrooms between 300 and 400 down to below the cell of 100 and sometimes down to non-detect. So, so great reductions. Sometimes we've seen an increase, which is we haven't quite figured out why that's happened, but I, that's how I said 95% of what we've seen has been very effective. Once we start the air sampling um, and continue that until we get to clean up, we require quarterly indoor air sampling just so we can make sure that we still have effective results. Um, I will say that the largest issue is the noise. The teachers don't like it. Um, but it also reduces indoor air concentration, so they're learning to adjust to it. I appreciate that and definitely makes sense. The noise would be a challenge. Um, I, I was gonna say, Sarah, I know you have to drop off. So if folks have questions specifically for Sarah, please feel free to, to both drop that in the Q and A. Um, you can also continue to raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question live. In the meantime, um, Carrie, I think this question is probably good for you, which is just about the availability of some of the the passive samplers, and um, you know, are those commercially available? What's the the scale and access to those look like? Yeah, I I hope people could use those. It, it works it works great. Um, we describe them completely in our papers, so you can find how to order it, um, and you can construct it yourself that it's uh yeah why it's it's not proprietary great i love that um we've also got a question about just the kind of the the political will that existed in vermont to make all of this a reality i mean looking at that timeline between the first school and and where we are now it's pretty amazing what you all have achieved um, curious reflections on what you felt like made that possible and any kind of advice for other states who are maybe thinking about taking this up. I'll start and then Sarah can add in. Um, I think it was a quick reaction and um, born out of concern for other schools. I would say there's still a lot of debate happening in the legislature over how it should move forward and that it should have been potentially a little more planned out with the uh, uh, funding resources and impacts to schools as part of that discussion, but they were very focused on uh, health impacts for this, the students that were there and trying to address that issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know that the legislature requires us to do projects and this so we didn't have much say in it. It was sort of given to us as in, this is a requirement and it must start in X number of months. And so you should get started. Um, but thank you. I will, um, Marielle, you can follow up with me if you need to. I need to scrape the two inches of snow off my car because now it's snowing. <laughs> <laughs> that is totally fair. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you. Joel, I'm curious what's popping up for you in terms of questions. Lots of questions. Thanks to everyone for the presentations. I have a question for Carrie. Um, when we think about exposure of stuff to kids, we usually think, well, at least I think about dirt and, and dust and things like that. I, I know your passive samplers sampled in paper phase, but have you included the exposure to dust in the schools as part of a calculation at least? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm really struck by this observation, this conclusion you've drawn, which is really important that the air exposure is as important as diet. That's that's a paradigm shift, right? We've, that's not what we teach in the in our schools. Um, but talk a little bit about dust and the dust in the in the classrooms. And has anyone looked at that? 
Yeah, I got thank you for asking that, Joel. There's two things I'd like to say. Um, first of all, the passive air samplers do cap capture um, fine particles as well. And um, many studies have shown that the um, air rate or the flow rate is, is the same for the fine particles. So our results indicate the respirable reason, um, concentration of PCBs in air on both particles and on gas phase, even though we know 90% of it is in the gas phase. But the second thing I wanna, I think, I think we're ready for another paradigm shift because PCBs accumulate on this film. And of course, the film on all the surfaces in the schoolroom, right? And so kids are touching that film all the time. And they it can result in ingestion. It could result in absorption. There's lots of other ways that that exposure route could be included. And I honestly think that the air sampling um, and especially the mission sampling that we're doing in Vermont schools is eventually going to help us get at that third route because um, you want to know the variability and, um, of that film and its effect. And I think that the data we're collecting will help us narrow that down to better understand what is the relationship between all that film uh, PCBs and the airborne PCBs and the solid material in the primary source of, of PCBs in that room. Um, lots of interesting new science is likely to come out of Vermont's uh, studies. Thanks, Carrie. I mean, it seems like the science of going from gas phase to concentrations on film for PCBs is fairly well established. Um, and also the, the the science around exposure of kids touching dirty surfaces and licking their fingers and things like that has has, has been established. I, I just wonder if you've done those, maybe not to share with the group, but have you taken yes. a whack at that? Have you taken the back of the yes, actual calculation the very, how big that might be? Yes, we have been working on that. But the variability I was talking about is not the variability within the room so much as the variability from room to room, school to school. What's the magnitude of variability and how does one translate that into the um, all the total exposure that kids get? You know, um, uh, Sarah Owens describes the approach that they did to um, regulating, which is a function of that calculation of exposure. And I think that putting that all together um, is now in a really good spot because Sarah's shown how you can use that to then uh, make a regulatory decision. And so it's 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 really dependent on the data available. The tool that she described that EPA has released for estimating children's exposure in air could also work for these other exposure routes, but it doesn't yet, in part because of the lack of data. And that's what I meant, is that the, the Vermont project's going to provide a lot of data. Very exciting. It sure is. Thanks, Carrie. Thank you. Doug Austin, go. Hi, uh, Doug Austin, Chesapeake Bay Program Office. Uh, kind of filling in for Greg, I guess, a little bit. Um, I've got a question for Carrie and one for Trish. Carrie, are other states are, are other states following a similar path or farther down or any other states uh, going through this process? Um, and Trish, um, I thought I read about six months ago that uh, obviously, 13 million isn't going to go very far. Um, that that not the state of the, of Vermont, but the I guess the AOE Education Department or some other entity has sued Monsanto. Any was that is that, is that possible? Is that true? I think Trish can answer my question too. I don't know what else is going on in other states. I know um, what people have published and nothing other than that. So the only other state that I've heard from is the state of Washington asking us questions about stuff that's happening in their legislative process. Um, the New England states keep a pretty close tally on what we're doing because what happens in one state in New England usually ends up happening in the next state because we are so small and so close together. Um, the state of Vermont has sued Monsanto. Um, 
and um, is working through that process right now with litigation, which is why there were people following carry around um, in some of the schools where we were sampling. And um, our expectation is $13 million is not enough, but we've shared that wide, widely and publicly with our legislature and so of the schools. <clears throat> Great. I think that answers all your questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I guess I'm curious, you know, we've talked a little bit about how innovation with some of the sampling helps us get a better understanding of this and the cost side of that as well. I'm curious in terms of kind of the management of, of materials once they're identified. If you had a magic wand, where would you like to see more more innovation? Oh, um, well, I think right now, I mean, we struggle with the ability to um, not impact the school a lot with the work that we're trying to do and um, not have a lot of um, options right now for cleanup. I mean, there's really removal, there's chemical removal extraction, there's you know, putting something over and then there's demolishing a building. So, I mean, I'm not aware of a lot of other great remedies that are out there to really help that are time effective and cost effective for us to be able to do this kind of work in schools. Um, so I think, you know, we're working with with what is most available to us um, and it's not, it doesn't appear to be a lot right now, so. That's totally fair. But gotta <laughs> use the best tools that you have, and yeah. you know, ho hopefully, some of this increased conversation might spark folks doing yes. research in, in some of those other encapsulation methods or or things that allow you to reduce exposure, kind of, um, well, without having to pull apart a building. So I don't want to say that those don't exist, but there are limited time frames in which they can be left in place. So we are, I mean, we meet weekly with our Region 1 counterparts, and they have been um, a great partner for us um, in, um, because we're inundating them with all the work we're doing also. Um, what happens in Vermont hits EPA too. So um, they, are, they are definitely helping us through this process as a partner. Um, but there are only time, there is a, a small time frame that um, you can allow for encapsulation of the material. So um, it's not a long term fix for most of the schools, but interim measure. So, yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Well, I know we're close to wrapping up. So, I guess any just final thoughts, if you were going to share one recommendation for either researchers, states, or regulators thinking about how to manage PCBs in buildings and specifically in schools, what would be your, your top takeaway, each of you? Everyone should get a, a PCB sniffing dog because I think I want one. <laughs> yeah, I, I would like a dog too. That, that, that'd be great. And I wanted to do it on a conjure specific basis so that I could get, I could figure out which ones are the, the dioxin like congeners and where are those coming from. And, <laughs> Right. So, you know, that's such a big question, Mariel, that, that, you know, it's a, that particular question is in constant discussion um, of uh, here, here at Iowa in our team, you know, and our team of toxicologists and engineers are like always trying to figure out what, what's the sweet spot that really needs, we need to be hitting right now. And, and there's so many issues. And personally, I think it's lack of data that's really um, hindering forward progress. And, and the opportunities for folks to collect more data, really every single school we do, we learn something new that we did not know before. And it happens so fast and so constantly that I'm like, wow, if think how much we would know if we had a lot more data, which we will, it's making a big impact, but you know what's going on in other states and in other environments, and how does the work from Vermont, Vermont translate to the rest of the country? I don't know. I think that is a compelling call to action, Carrie, and I'm certainly seeing interest in the chat in that as well. So appreciate all that you all have done to really be brave leaders in this. Um, 
and to, to step into some unknown territory. Thank everyone for participating. I particularly want to thank our co-conveners, the US EPA and the Washington State Department of Ecology. They've been with us from the beginning um, organizing this series. Um, so thanks to them. And I want to thank EPA for supporting the Puget Sound Institute long term.